So, thank you everybody. Um, first thing to note, uh, if you see that URL there, and yes, there is space, which is why the percent 20. Uh, we're assuming you're all web people, so you already understand that. Uh, that's the actual current set of slides. The plan is to keep the slides updated over time. So if you probably refresh that every so often, you'll get a new PDF. Uh, we're doing this little road show, at least at a couple of other conferences this year, so the slides will get better over time. Uh, let me see what else. Should I announce anything else? No, that's it. So, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Alan Kassendorf, also known as Dormando, on mailing lists and so forth and so on. My name is Brian Aker. I'm with MySQL. And what we're going to talk about today is new cache deep. Um, I would like to encourage all of you that if you have a question to raise your hand and to ask it when you actually feel the need. If you feel the need too often, then I'll probably stop answering. But for the most part, uh, this is, these work out much better when uh, they're interactive. And probably if you have a question, someone else does as well. So first thing is, what's all this about? Um, Mimcached is a high-performance distributed memory object caching system. Generic in nature, but intended for use in speeding up dynamic web applications by a leading database load. So this was Brad's original definition, and this sits on the front page of Denga.com. So if you were to go there, and you go find Denga.com Mimcached, this is what you'd find. And this was his kind of early description of what was going on. So who actually uses this thing? Well, first thing to know is a lot of people use this. Facebook, Yahoo, Amazon, LiveJournal, Mixi. Uh, pretty much, if you're a Web 2.0 company at this point, you're probably using Mimcached, or you're probably trying to reinvent the similar technology to do the same thing. Uh, so this is pretty widely well in use uh, technology. Second point to this is, why would you ever do this in the first place? So why would you want to use this Mimcached thing? And the answer is, that. <laughs> that, is, that is an original description by Brad of the chaos uh, that was LiveJournal. You've got all these machines, you've got all these pieces talking all these databases, and you can test that there's masters, and there's read replication, and there's failover. And, and actually, we're, Alan here is the man who actually can remember all this because he's one of the people who helped set it up. Oops. <laughs> so this is a little bit about where they started out with. Now, Mimcached was originally, just to go back in history, was originally created for LiveJournal. So why are they actually using it? LiveJournal uh, <coughs> evolved, it evolved a bit over time. We had the, the mass, the chaos, and then we went to user-based clustering, and then we realized databases were still slow and expensive. So I moved on, and then Brad decided to invent Mimcached at some point. And basically, uh, what it turned out is after they started implementing that, they started adding, toward, uh, adding caching to, or recaching to everything, uh, the load dropped on all the databases by a factor of 10. And so it was a pretty big motivator to continue developing this, continue using it, and also Brad had the foresight to open source it, because everything provides more open source. And so that's the origin of MCACHD comes from there. Uh, Live Journal today has about 30 gigabytes of cache available. It's over, I think, about eight or twelve machines, and that's okay. There's uh, many, many terabytes of user data on LiveJournal. Lots and lots of blog posts, comments, everything. Billions and billions and billions of those. But we only really need a small percentage of that to be cached. So we don't need to have uh, six terabytes of, of cache data to cache six terabytes of data. That's pretty good for efficiency. And also, any write we do, uh, LiveJournal is very, very read cache focused. So you load a, a somebody's journal or somebody's comment post, you're, you're caching that data. We're not caching uh, data that is dependent on the rights. So if you want to do a journal post and we have to look up some data or there would be some data in cache that we could use to help make that faster, we forego that and instead talk to the database directly to ensure that we have the freshest data. So it's, uh, we ensure consistency with, uh, with our own data set while ensuring that everything is fast by by really pushing the read cache aspect. And it's very, very simple, very, uh, there are a lot of companies uh, out there which we'll talk about which have much more advanced, much more unique setup, but really this is the most well-rounded introduction to it. So this was a diagram done by Patrick Lenz of uh, Einstein.d. Uh, some of you might know Patrick Lenz also because he's the maintainer of freshmeat.net. So 
He was, uh, this was a, a diagram he did, uh, Einstein D and how they actually use MemCached D. And this is one model that we actually see. So up there we see the internet and we have a web server. In this case, he actually uses a web server called Lighty. And so Lighty sits here, talks to some number of application servers, and these application servers all go and store their data inside of MySQL. So incoming data, someone wants to create an account. That data that is to create the account is then sent into the MySQL database. So the MySQL database grabs that data and it's inserted. At the same time, you have readers coming in. Readers want to say, read the information about that user. They want to read a complex set of objects on a page. Don't only think of memcached in the manner of, I want to store a single user object. Ask yourself, if I've got three or four things that are fairly expensive pieces to build, like there was a healthcare site I was looking at where they had to build a graph of someone's entire healthcare history and their chart history and all this other stuff. By actually building an object and storing that object in memcached they didn't have to real time build up all that data. And one of the great tricks, or, or not even tricks, but one of the great truths to scaling large websites is all about taking things which are synchronous actions and turning them into asynchronous events. Whenever you can turn something into an asynchronous event, that means you can probably scale it. Until it's asynchronous, it's probably not all that scalable. So in this case, he's got dispatchers. And there's been many types of dispatchers actually written. And these dispatchers would sit there and say, hmm, I need to read data. So they would actually go down in MCACHD and pull up objects. So they'd say, oh, look, this user account isn't available. Well, if I take a select that represents these three tables based on a user, because I have some user information here and user information there, and I build a user object up, I can then store that user object inside of MCACHD and then retrieve it based on the user ID of the user. So it's not only a single row of data, it's actually complex objects that can be serialized into it. And pretty much all the drivers today can actually make this happen for you. This is actually what's interesting about Patrick's uh, architecture. You'll notice that he actually writes everything to a MySQL 5.0 server, but then he actually uses a multi-master replication to replicate that data over and then pulls the data from MimCacheD's existing on the actual slave. And this is a, a not so uncommon uh, solution. But in MimCached, we either see it sometimes close to uh, the database, or it can be entirely out on machines by itself. So don't only think single row, think complex objects and then store. And in his case, for instance, a cache miss from MimCached would actually just cause the dispatcher then to read data out of MySQL, build up the complex object, and then store that object inside of MimCached for later somebody to come through and read. So this is the case for um, uh, Einstein E. And Patrick, if you want to come up, I'll be able to next. Um, I'd ask Patrick to come in and talk about Grazer, because Grazer is a little bit more of an interesting solution, um, where Grazer is more of a write-through cache problem. So he's running memcached on the app server? Yeah, he's actually, well, in this case, he actually is running memcached e directly on the database server, which I would not normally recommend. Um, I have a suspicion about why he did that, and it's because at the time, if I remember the hardware he had purchased, it was all 32-bit machines. And on a 32-bit machine, at most MySQL can only access so much memory. So he put memcached E's on the same database server to use up the excess memory that the MySQL server couldn't actually use. Okay. Um, we definitely see that where you see the cache, we see in different environments. So for instance, sometimes the cache is off on its own machines. Memcached E is running on machines. Sometimes it's put very close next to the application server itself. And sometimes, like Patrick's case, it's actually stored in the database. So I think that's much rare. Um, when it's stored in the application server, the thing to keep in mind is that while it uses a TCP IP uh, protocol, TCP IP was long ago um, optimized so that a local lookup, local host connection is pretty much, at this point, really just an in-memory transfer of data. So it's the same thing as writing an in-memory uh, driver yourself. There's a little bit of overhead cost for the actual uh, connect cost, but once it's actually in the driver, it's just a memory copy back and forth. So TCP is actually pretty efficient in these cases. So, but you'll see memcached in all these different environments. So what I was going to ask Patrick to do was actually explain Razor, which is more of a write-through cache. So with Razor, our whole process is that we want to serve out feeds. We collect feeds through a process where a user has a, a feed request and the URL to the feed. So 
what we do is we go out and we fetch the content of that feed, and originally we would just store that in the database atomically at that moment. And we found it was pretty expensive, and so we thought, what part of this can we make asynchronous, as you say? So I came up with an idea, of course, I want to use memcache because this will be a buffer for the caches that we have to serve. We have to serve out JSON, a JSON version of that feed. But we also have a back-end process where we take all the items of the feed and enclosures and store it. Because ultimately what we want to do is to be able to do a merge of feeds. If the user says, I want to merge all these feeds, take all the items and create a merge of that. So I came up with this idea, and Brian has since told me I probably should just look at Gearman, but I wrote a, a daemon called GrazerD, and uh, I wrote a UDF that talks to GrazerD and sends it commands. So if it's something that doesn't have to be atomic, what happens is we take care of the caching part of that. We serve out the JSON to the widget. But then great, we have we write to a table called stored objects. Stored objects has a UDF on it that says, Write something to greater D. Greater D then, oh, we also, I'm sorry, we, when we store it in store objects, we also put the JSON in the cache, but we also put another object in there, and that's the normalized uh, feed object. It's a DOM object, basically, with all the items. So when we write to stored objects, it fires off the, the, a UDF that then talks to greater D. Greater D calls a process that goes into memcache, grabs the serialized, you know, the DOM object feed deletes it from there and then takes that and then stores it in its components into the database. So it worked it's worked out really good. There are some things we've learned that some things we actually do want to be atomic, but it's all an adjustment thing. But memcached has allowed us to take a lot of what used to be really expensive web process and to do it um, asynchronously in the background. We do it in bulk too. Thank you. We also do it in bulk to make Oh yeah, we changed our insert. We used to insert items one at a time. And this caused replication delay. So I found bulk inserts really helped. Hey Patrick, you're yeah. not the Patrick that was just on the previous slide. Oh, I'm not Patrick Lenz. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a freshman guy. I'm, the, I'm Captain Tofu. That's my moniker out there, if you've ever seen it. Since all of us have worked in the back, Patrick's also one of the original people who worked on Slashdot. So whoever saw the Captain Tofu stuff, that is actually Patrick. And there will be another PC he's going to talk about that I have some involvement with. The right through caching stuff, I think, the right through caching stuff has been really interesting because as we started expanding, we noticed that a number of people are doing other things even than just working with databases. There's a down under Geo Solutions, which one of the earlier uh, users of Libman Cache D came along. And they were kind of interesting because they're not even a web application. What they do is they do processing of some secret data they won't tell me about, which is not my business. But what they do is they have it stored in very large objects inside of what's called Lustra. And Lustra is a, uh, an open source GPL uh, object system, sort of like Mobile FS, um, where you can store very large objects and scatter those out across many different nodes. So it's another clustering kind of clustering file system, which is non posix what they do is actually just take objects out of there, take the objects and split them up and then store them in an MCached. Um, they did this so that now when they're working on uh, a given object, it's very expensive to pull that object, pull that object apart and process that. But, and at the same time, by then, instead of making that an expensive operation, pull it out, tear it apart, work on that piece, they can actually parallelize their operation. They, tear it, they pull it out, they tear it apart, stick it inside the LRU cache, uh, of memcache D and then sit there and churn it instead as they need to, pulling out new objects as they need and then sitting there parsing as they need. They've been able to build out their actual cluster in a way such they keep pretty much everything they're usually actively working on in memory, which keeps down the problem of the expensive quit request outside the, outside of the Lustra system. So we see this also used in a lot of batch processing networks. Um, and I'll, I'll get into some issues with that if you're running on, uh, on the Amazon Web Services, but this is actually starting to become a common case also for the catch needs. So looking at this and looking at Patrick, this is not only just about what can you do to take an object and feed it out of website, it's about getting fast object, getting access to objects in general across your entire architecture. So the whole issue of how does this thing actually work? So what exactly is Memcached D? Memcached D is uh, 
stupid, dumb, doesn't do anything, or does very, very little. And we like it that way. Nemcatch B is based around a very simple daemon. You start it, just wants to get sets, or sets, get, add, replace, whatever. Um, and it does that sitting on top of a very simple file allocator. So uh, MKC was originally, originally written, uh, just every time you store an object, it would do a malloc. It would allocate some memory from the operating system, it would stick an object in it, and when the object was dead, it would free that memory. Or if it, needed to, if it ran out of memory, it would free that memory. And we found out, or they found out, I was involved at the time, that was very, very slow. I might have known that too, but I think everybody here understands that. Malloc an awful lot of things, large objects, mix and this and that, it would slow down eventually. Uh, so they came up with a very simple class-based slab allocator, and this works by from the 10,000 foot overview. You start in cache D, you say that you have 128 megs of RAM. I'm going to give you 120 megs of RAM and store a whole bunch of different objects. What then cache D does is it makes one slab allocator for different sizes of your your objects. So you might have an object that is 100 bytes, or 1,000 bytes, or 2,000 bytes, or half a megabyte. And those would end up in completely different slab classes. And what this allows us to do is have a very, very simple, very, very flat slab allocator that is very, very fast. And there are some trade-offs to that that we'll get, we'll get to over the course of this tutorial, I hope. Uh, but that's that's really it. If you have if you store 10 million 100 byte objects and you run out of memory, it starts bringing it up. Uh, the other big, or the other real big simpleness about it is that it's event-based. So it's, it's written around libevent, which is a uh, generic wrapper around uh, things like equal, KQ, uh, some events, and allows you to do very scalable network connections, network operations, anything. So you can connect 10,000 clients to a memcached and it will be ignoring it. It doesn't matter. The only thing that really matters to memcached is all the clients that are actively sending the data. And, and old style web servers, old style uh, things like this, I guess, uh, you can connect 10,000 connections to it, and every time you would go and, and ask your service, do I have any data on any of these 10,000 connections, it would spend an awful lot of time. You would have to pull each individual socket and say, do I have new data? No, I don't have new data. I'm going to go check this one now. 500 through 3,000 or whatever. It takes a long time. But then you don't have any of that. And it also take, take, took a lot of the complexity out of this code and made it very portable. So MCAT will run on an awful lot of things. Uh, the protocol is very simple. There's a lot of arguments about whether it's good or not. Uh, everybody hates it, but everybody uses it, so I'm not really sure what to take away from that. <laughs> uh, Brad, I think, might have been drunk, who knows? Uh, it's very, very simple. You can fire up Telnet, talk to it, type commands, you can test it in just a couple minutes. You can open up protocol.txt and write a client in any language in very, very little time. And that's really gave it a lot of power and helped it uh, really help adoption. Um, the server itself, so we talked about the slab out here a little bit. Um, and otherwise, MKHD is just a big, stupid hash table. You have your hash native dictionaries, whatever, your normal language, and MKHD is essentially that. Uh, but in the case of a grid, it is a distributed hash table. So what it is in practice is two hash tables. You have your hash table from your client, which hashes out your key onto your list of servers. And then you have a hash table inside of MKHD, which is very, which is fairly flat. So you have it that will take a key and look it up directly against whatever slab class it is and pull back your item and send it back to you very, very fast. And the other really cool trick is that these things, you know, I said it was stupid, I really mean it. They have no idea. They are blindfolded. So you can have 30 MKHDs and they don't need to know about each other. You don't need to spend four hours configuring it like some other cluster <laughs> solutions. Uh, there's no cross traffic. You don't have to buy any Finiband network just to make it work. There, you just add more servers, and it's not quite magic. I would be doing the service pretending it was magic, but it is pretty goddamn simple. So one of the things that's key here is that with MimCache D, the uh, well, we'll get into the client stuff, is that the servers really don't know anything at all about the actual network. Um, in MimCache D. Um, the world is, is that the client has all the intelligence. So instead of putting a whole lot of processing inside a single server that's going to sit there on a machine and eventually be bottlenecked on that, instead all of the actual service processing generally happens in clients. Cl 
clients understand the network. Clients are the ones who actually decide what to connect to. There are, there's no management components. The clients go at everything in an algorithm method. And I'll talk a little bit about how the algorithms are when we get more key examples. But the thing to know is that clients hash keys to the server list. Inside of the new cache to you world, if you have one server, well, if you have two servers, up to having thousands of servers, and there are environments out there that have tens of thousands of servers at this point, what they would do is they would take a single key that's about 250 bytes max, they take that value, the client does, and then uh, hashes that. And by hashing it, it turns it into a number that is then used for distributing it out. And I have a slide in a second that talks about distributing, so I'm not going to go too into that. Um, the serialization of objects doesn't happen actually inside of the server, and it doesn't even often happen in the client. Now, some of the clients actually do have serialization built into them. For instance, the standard original Perl client, I believe, uses storable. Okay. Uses storable to take, for instance, a Perl object or a Perl structure, turn that into a serialized byte array, and then send that byte array down the line. Something like libbimcached, which is written in C just understands byte arrays. So for instance, if you hand it a, a serialized JSON object or an HTML page, it handles that as any byte array goes. They really don't track what is the payload of what's going on inside of the server. It's really much more about you have a value, uh, you want to get access to it, here's a key. But keep in mind that your client keys that are used up at the top are not always the same client keys that the actual server is going to be. So there's multiple hashing going on. Um, and some of the clients will do things, additional things, for instance, like compressed data. So a lot, there's a little bit of variance in each given client as to what the client actually supports on the end. So questions that usually start to come up at this point when people start is, how do I dump data? Uh, how is it redundant? Uh, how does it handle failover? And how does it authenticate? So uh, how do I dump data? You don't. Exactly. It's a cache. Um, people get it as, well, we have 40 memcached need servers. We want to dump all that, so we want to save the state of it. If you're thinking that way, you're probably thinking in the wrong direction. It's use a cache. I'm sorry, what? Use the database. Use the database. That's where you use the database for. This is all about caching. You're not talking about dumping. It has some limited ability to dump the keys out of it, but we usually don't talk about that very much. Yes. Uh, and uh, how is it uh, redundant? Oh. Yeah, so it's not redundant at all. Um, the server itself, like we said, doesn't know anything about other servers around it. Now, there's an asterisk there. It's because at least Heckle and, well, LibMimCached in and the, the next version both support replication. So this is a question where it's not really up to the server, but the question is, can clients exist that can actually do the replication? So there is redundancy, but the redundancy in that intelligence exists in clients. Uh, how does it handle failover? It doesn't. Yeah, so when it dies, it dies. Um, the question is, is then, do you have a client that's, for instance, doing distributed caching? If a client's doing distributed caching, which I have a diagram that shows the wheel of how this works, then you can have failover. But by itself, then cache D is a very dumb hash table. Uh, the last part is uh, exactly this comes up occasionally for people who want to do SOC uh, SOC compliance. Of how does it authenticate? Doesn't at all. Yeah, there is no authentication. Much like other cluster products, we don't authenticate. The good news is that most SOX people who are coming in saying, you know, what well, we need to do SOX compliance testing, well, they know that they have a checklist there that says for a database, the database has to have these 10 features for SOX compliance. And they say, we have this thing called MimCached, and they go, that's not on the list. Oh, I guess it's just SOX compliant by nature. So, anyway, the good news is uh, it's not on anybody's radar. <laughs> The server has, if you're, you're sticking one of these uh, open face to the internet, it's a really bad idea. <laughs> it, it has no authentication mechanism. Uh, when you connect to it, you have full access to any of the, uh, you have full access to any of the objects inside the server, any commands in the server. So for instance, if anybody types uh, flush in the server, well, your data goes away. Yeah, so that's the good news. Uh, this is a little bit how it works. So think of this, it's a very, very simple service and a very simple server. So details on the actual server itself. Um, this is essentially the protocol today, these commands. In fact, almost nearly these commands, you can actually tell that to the port and type and get out information. Um, there's a set get and replace, which I have sneaking suspicion where I was just copying MySQL at that point. And add. Oh, and add. Oh, I've got a pen to pretend. Oh, okay, I'm missing a couple. 
So you can set operations. You can set an operation so it will throw data inside of MimCached. It doesn't care if data was there or not. You can get from it. You can replace. Um, you can also uh, what's the set add? Add. Yeah. You can also add data so that data will only get inserted if, for instance, uh, the data wasn't there already. So there are some lightly weight atomic operations. You can append to a given object, which can be really abused, I might add. So, for instance, uh, what is it? We hacked up a, a keeping all the keys on the server by any key coming into the server just got appended to an object. Um, this has certain limitations to it, being memory. About a megabyte and then your data goes away. Yeah, uh, so it's perhaps not the best idea actually to do that. But you can do a pen, a pre pen. Um, you can implement increment and decrement functions. So, for instance, if you needed to create an environment where Based on key value, I want to know that I always want to get a plus one to that or a minus one. It actually supports add and decrement features. Uh, uh, yeah, increment and decrement. There's also the beginnings of what I would call cast operations. You can do a you do a, a, a set conditional is uh, on set if you are absolutely certain that what you were setting against was based off the object you already have. So if you do a, a get uh, again, S is what it's called. You return a special, it returns a special cast value. And then if you then try to update that object, you want to ensure that uh, if you're basing your decision on whatever calculation you're making off of what's already in memory, uh, you want to make sure that when you write it back to memcached, that you, you're not overwriting somebody else or you're not going to be overwritten or if you are overwritten, it's for a good reason. So it makes sure that uh, you're making sure that, that whatever you put back in is based off of what you've already seen. So all the drivers you're seeing are just implementing off these basic commands. So every driver extends these. Um, so as we add pieces to the, the server, drivers themselves can actually have more operations they can perform. Like cast today is pretty primitive. You can do a gets on an object, like Alan was saying, it'll give you back an ID, and then you can make sure that if you're doing a set on the operation, that you're actually doing a, a set on the operation that you meant to actually use that, that object itself. Um, Stats, for instance, is another operator. Stats allows you to connect to the server and either ask for particular pieces of detail, like particular information, or you can get the full dump of the actual the memcached server operates itself. You can, the, the, on its own, you just go in and type stats and it'll answer most people's questions. How many bytes might be inferring, how many gets. You can calculate your, your, your hit ratio, your cache efficiency ratio, how much memory is being used, and the uptime in the server, all the, all the basic stuff. But there's a lot of uh, not documented very well yet, but they're starting. They were uh, mostly developer in interfaces before. You stack items, stack sizes, uh, maybe stack slabs or something. And then these these extra commands will tell you more information about uh, MoonCache. Exactly what are the sizes of the objects that you're storing? Exactly how often are my my slabs used? And as of recent versions, how how many evictions per slab class or how many memory errors am I getting? Um, and these are becoming a little more useful now. So what does this thing actually run on? So today, FreeBSD and Linux are probably the top tier supported, uh, top tier supported uh, platforms at this point. Um, many, 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 many shops uh, use uh, MimCached e on Linux. Just curiosity, how many people today are running MimCached e that are in the audience? So a good chunk of you. And how many of you are running on Linux? How about FreeBSD? A couple people on FreeBSD? Are you guys from Yahoo? <laughs> okay. Yahoo actually keeps MimCached running on. Uh, yeah, one guy raised his hand. MimCached uh, is actually kept running for even it on FreeBSD 4 because they they still use FreeBSD 4. So FreeBSD is a very well supported platform at this point. Uh, Windows exists. I don't know much more I can say about it. your uh, every release I make. I have for new Windows maintainer and nobody's really shown off, but there are patches out there floating uh, some binaries that have been kind of haphazardly maintained. So if you want a one two three version. Get it, but it's not really officially tracked. How many people need MimCached for Windows? Okay, one guy barely raised his hand. Do <laughs> <laughs> I want to pay for the support anyway? Uh, so Windows is one of those few platforms that everything else I do for love, but that one it's money. Uh, the uh, <laughs> money, wine, pretty much how it operates entirely. Yeah, that's pretty much how it operates entirely. Um, so yeah. Solaris, uh, Sun started kicking in patches as of 1.2.5, so that Solaris is now well supported as of 1.2.5. Uh, 
Um, they've been adding a number of other things to it as well, like large memory support. And we'll talk about roadmap in the end. I'd say OSX has good support. Uh, unless you're breaking it. Yeah. Sure, fine. I know I test on it. I don't know who else tests on it. Okay, at least two or three people test on it. Did anybody actually deploy Memcached D today on OSX? Nope. Anyway. Uh, by the way, 10.5's TCPIP stack is completely broken. That's another story I'll get. Um, so anyway, that's OSX. So application integration. So how is this thing actually being, is it ever uh, integrated inside of application environments? Well, the one thing to notice is um, there's MySQL integration. Today there's, uh, most users grab objects from the database, store objects to Memcached D. Um, UDF usage is actually growing. In fact, the UDF, the UDF, uh, uh, the UDF and MCAST D functions are pretty much uh, one, probably the only successful UDF project ever to exist in MySQL history. Because um, they just never, everybody thinks, oh, that's neat, and it never actually releases them and keeps going with them. Uh, Patrick's the maintainer of that, and I've got slides there I'm talking about then. Uh, so MySQL integration is actually starting to, to integrate more. Uh, we have a Google Summer of Code <coughs> student that's actually working on implementing it against the query cache. So you can have large distributed query caches, which might make query cache far more usable than what it is today. Uh, and there's some other pieces today that we're, we're looking at actually doing. Um, there is Postgres uh, stuff. Uh, it's PG Memcache. Uh, I don't know anything about it, so I do know it exists. Uh, other than that, uh, it's family, it seems to be about the same equivalent of, say, the MySQL UDFs. Um, there is integration on the YD uh, mod and cache side. Uh, basically, inside of YD, it can actually cache object, uh, cache files from disk. So if you come in and do a request, it will actually store the, the request inside of memory, at that point inside of memcached D, and then access it uh, whenever it comes back up and access it from the memcached, uh, from the memcached layer. Uh, you can specify mine types, you can do create expire types, so if a page is expensive to build, it will pull it up and keep it for a while. Yes? What do they use to create the key for the for what goes into So I believe it's actually the URL is what they're actually caching. Okay. That's my understanding. I don't think anybody's done a session one yet. Okay. That's a really good idea, but uh, nobody's done it. Um, so that's a little bit on the Whitey side. Um, for Apache, we have mod min cache D. Uh, it has uh, cache operations exposed. Um, it's different than the, than the Whitey solution, mainly because what it does today is you actually push objects into min cache D and then those objects are based on its, are it's used for URL building to actually respond with the object. So for instance, if you were looking at something like page.txt, if page.txt existed inside the memcached D cluster, it would go in, grab it, and then serve that right off the top of the uh, given cache. So you can just feed objects into your memcached D and then supply those back out through an HTTP port. Uh, it has support for get, put, and delete. Uh, it has cache operations that are exposed. So for instance, you can do a deletion operation or a uh, put operation uh, based on the pass <coughs> operator, so you can make sure that you're destroying the correct objects in and out. So that's kind of a generic HTTP solution. Um, it is still in alpha today, um, though I think I've been told of a couple that are already using it, which is kind of scary. Uh, Pandora port is actually my project to test it, um, which is just a, a website that you can go in and feed objects to it or return objects to you. It's basically a big old place for spammers at this point. Um, but it still exists and it's being tested. So implementation on the server side, limits. So it's, uh, there's no free lunch with this thing. Uh, there are, when you're using it, you have to be aware of some several limits that are in the server. Uh, as far as data size goes, as far as what you can do, as far as uh, things as complicated as changing the way your data works over time is, is also something you have to keep in mind that. Uh, but also you can keep in mind that a lot of these are tunable. You can actually, recon if you really want to, you can recompile them in D and have 20 megabyte objects. There are lots of ramifications to that. Uh, we might, uh, we'll probably discuss that and talk a little bit more about how the side allocator works. But if you really want 65k keys, you can do that. If you want more uh, bigger item sizes, you can do that. Uh, we have to be uh, very, very familiar, very, very aware of what you're doing. Uh, most basics are, of course, the key size, longer than 250 characters. It kind of, I'm not thinking of the hands of that level, and I give them error, key is too long, what are you doing? Um, 
so a lot of people uh, will actually MD5 or SHA-1, their, their object key, if it's too long, or cut it or use different points of parts of it. Uh, the data size has to be under a megabyte, that is the largest, based on the largest slot class in the system. So you have, when we actually start, to create slot classes from 100 bytes or the minimum is up to the maximum, and the maximum default is happens to be a meg, and that seems to work pretty well. If you have a web, in general, if you have a website, if you're pulling one megabyte objects for every single page view and de and demarshaling that and all, and all those sorts of things, probably not going to be performing too well. So they don't tend to get that large. Uh, you also have to be very, very careful if you're running a 32 bit system. Don't go over that 2 gate, 4 gate barrier. You will say fault and you will, your cache efficiency will go to hell and be very, very sad. Uh, there's a MCACHD, when you say max byte and you limit it and you come up and you bring up the server and say you can use a gig of memory, 2 gig of memory, it's not, it's not the only limit. Is there a memory limit for the 64 bits OS as we should concern ourselves with? The amount of RAM in your system. Very good. Uh, 64 bit systems are great. You can just use that. You can use as much memory as is reasonable and as is available. But uh, if you have a 32 bit system and you say, well, the limit here is 2 gigs, so I'm going to say max bytes is 2 gigs. And then it, that is just for the slab algorithm, just for item storage. So as soon as you start using it, you do a large multi-get request. You send in several thousand keys. So you have a client batch processor. I want 4,000 keys from this. So it'll allocate a couple of buffer and then set fault because you are out of memory at that point. Uh, it would be nice. We have some having fixed and starts at actually having limits on all of memory, so you can be very very certain that it won't go over a certain amount that's not implemented right now. I think in the Perl client, you can also tell it uh, which compressed threshold to use so you can actually get bigger things in there. Yes, uh, well, lots of clients have compression, you know, compression built in. You can say over 10,000 bytes, over 100,000 bytes, you actually want to compress this thing. I think about 500 to uh, 500,000 bytes, you actually start getting a benefit out of it. Um, so there, there is a little bit of overhead in the way it works. Uh, I think I've got a question on this. You said, I mean, the item test, but if I understand what you're saying, is you can fill up all the RAM on your machine um, with items, and then as you add too many keys, uh, you might say fault server because the max byte doesn't account for the hash table. The max bytes, you know, it does not actually account for the hash table, uh, but the, the hash table is relatively the only couple megabytes compared to uh, the actual key storage. So oh, okay, the key storage. That's the key, the, the key storage is not in the hash table. The computation of the hash is in the hash table. So the max bytes parameter on the daemon then is not necessarily how much it's, you're, you're not limiting the <coughs> to that amount of memory. Correct. It is misleading and I'm sorry. <laughs> and you're forgiven. I mean, <laughs> for people who are newer to MCACD, can you explain what happens when you fill up the server with a uh, value? What happens when I try to insert another key and I'm already used up all of the memory in MCACD? So I think we will go into a lot more detail on that when we start talking about this, the way the slide out here works. And actually, we have a whole slide on the LRU, which is here. Uh, <laughs> So MemCached, one of the reasons why it's so easy to use and so self-maintainable is because you can just throw whatever you want in there. And that is uh, mark, uh, managed by the LRU. And there isn't one, this is the least recently used uh, memory management system. So if you, if you insert, if you set an object and you say, I'm going to expire you in 10 days, it's a good solid object and stick around for a while. And then you fill up your cache with other, with other bits of memory that also want to stay around for 10 days. Uh, and you, nine days later, you insert an object, and MemCached is out of memory, and it'll take that last, the oldest object that you've not looked at recently, one that is not hot, obviously, and has not been, been used at all, not loaded in the user's page, and just evict it from the cache. And then we'll, once it tosses out that other item, it'll have room, room for a new one. <coughs> that prevents you from having to, uh, if you run out of memory, it's not that big of a deal. The old item will go away. And expired items, I expired items go away before that even. Uh, so also, you have to keep in mind that we talk about slot classes a lot. I'm sorry that the slider is so late in the presentation. But uh, for each class of item that exists in the slider, there's an, an individual LRU. So if you have, if you store several large objects, 
and you're not out of memory in a large slot class, but you could be out of memory in a smaller slot class, and those, these other years all work independently of each other. So if you put into a 100 byte item, it won't evict a 500 kilobyte item. It'll evict another 100, 100 byte item. And also, the LRU is, sorry. Will it evict the 100 byte item if there's, say, a 1 meg slab still floating around out there unused? If there is unused memory, it will allocate that to the slot class. Uh, un unallocated from the operating system. Um, and also, it, you can, every time there is an actual eviction, it takes a counter. So if you log into the server and type stats, it'll say how many times you did, had to evict items that were not already expired. And you can keep an eye on that, you can graph it, you can have an audio alert on it, it's wonderful. As a 125, you have uh, very specific details on what's causing evictions. You can say, well, my small objects are causing a lot of evictions. Or my, my large objects are causing, causing a lot of evictions. Maybe I should compress them. Maybe I should break them up. Maybe I should just get more memory. Uh, I think that's it. And uh, also, the MKHD supports threads after uh, Stephen Grimm from Facebook came along in the whirlwind of pain, migrated the thing to have a very basic threading implementation. And you probably don't need this unless you are. Facebook or somebody else who's gigantic, ridiculously large. MCAST's CPU footprint is tiny. Uh, we have some pretty cool graphs later on that will show you exactly, you know, 30,000 requests per second hitting the server, 30,000 gets, 5,000 sets, whatever, and the thing is dead silent. You can just put, you can, if you have web servers around, you add memory to them, you put MCAST on it, and you can continue sucking up all your CPU in the past, you won't care. You'll care a little bit if you're completely out of CPU. It really doesn't care that much. How many of you all today have, uh, how many of you today are buying 64-bit systems? How many people are buying 32-bit systems? Yeah. How many of you buy, how many of you are still buying one, one single CPU machines, no cores? So the answer is that this goes back into the whole argument with threads. Pretty soon we're going to remove it so that it's just, NuCacheD is threaded all the time. Because NuCacheD does perform much better when you have multi-CPUs and you let it use multiple CPUs. So that's, uh, right now, you might not need it, but going forward, uh, certainly if you have larger instances, if you have 32 gigs of memory, in, or 64, 128, a couple of years, you might have 384 gigs of RAM and whatever many cache engines you're running. And the cores, the cores are not really getting faster anymore. In some cases, they're getting slower. We just have more than you know, 8, 12, 32, 64, lots and lots of cores, often very slow cores. So we do have to adapt a bit there and make sure that, or ensure that uh, the <coughs> will scale across this, this change in computing. Would, would you just have multiple That is typically what people have done up until this point, or up until Fred existed, we're running multiple MCACHDs, but for the next line, uh, if you're doing multi gates if you are catching uh, a lot of keys that are similar, you send them all out in one request, you all, if you have one big instance, that request is parsed once against one instance. You have the whole 10 instances of all of your data. It's also easier for one system to actually be able to manage the whole given image range instead of having multiple systems sitting there trying to, to manage. So we're kind of moving away from the, you know, we have this whole programming paradigm where, well, threads were cute but really weren't needed, to where threads are pretty much required now to, in the database world, it was interesting to watch this happen. In, in the early parts of the, the 80s and 90s, what we saw were people tried fork implementations in the database world, and then we discovered that fork implementations, multiprocessing, doesn't scale long term. So what you end up moving is you move to threaded implementations where you use threads to actually handle it. So this is kind of the Oracle observed this, Sybase did this quite some time, MySQL started in that, so we see thread-based. I think Firebird, as of their latest release, finally got rid of their, their processing background and now actually have moved it to a threaded environment. So this is something we've seen as far as a changing paradigm, actually, in the program. So this works, the, the way threading works today, it works pretty well. Uh, we don't know of any, any major bugs. If you find them, please report them. Uh, but they're basically, uh, the way threading works now is based around the fact that parsing your command is a lot slower than anything else things want to do. If fetching, uh, looking up on the hash table where your object is, fetching it from, from the slaver, are all almost free operations. But actually parsing your command, parsing the text that comes in or the, or the new binary command, 
whatever that takes off actually a fairly significant amount of CPU. So the threading implementation is based around scaling out uh, that part of it, but everything else is actually uh, very stupid, very big blocks. You can only have one thread talking to the hash table at one point, at any point in time. You can have one thread talking to the allocator, the item allocator, the slide allocator, any of these subsystems are, are just big monolithic mutexes. And that's still all right now. Under eight cores, it's, it's kind of iffy, and the year or two is going to suck. So one of the things that we're actually looking at, the, kind of the advantage of something being acquired by a large company with lots and lots of hardware is, you know, I get a question last week in email which said, we're building four terabyte machines. How well will that work with MinCache-D? Like, huh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> and uh, we, there's an interesting price point where it may make sense to buy these things instead of buying, you know, hundreds of machines to make it up. But part of the thing is that we're starting to try to look at, um, especially the, the Trondheim team uh, that works inside the Sun, is how to actually scale um, MinCache-D to make use of much, much massively larger amounts of RAM and much massively amounts of processors. And the Sun's announcement was the 128 processor machine now that's going to replace the T2000s, which I've forgotten exactly under. T2000 was like under 10 grand for a 64 processor machine. So anyway, it'll be interesting to actually see what happens there. So the, the magic around Memcache's efficiency is this slabbing allocator that I've been alluding to over the last 20, 30 slides. Uh, Memcache doesn't want to give memory back to your system. If you can start it up with the limit n max bytes, 2 gigs, 16 gigs, whatever, you're not going to get that back. If you let it all expire, if you run the flush command, you're not going to get your memory back. Uh, and it's very confusing for people when they first run the flush and see it doesn't actually do anything at all. Um, but that's actually good. Uh, what we do, we take a very specific corn case trade-off for what is a, usually a fairly, uh, a fairly, it's a good trade-off. It's, it's fast, uh, it's adding a little bit of memory overhead, but it means we don't have to constantly cycle back to the operating system if we want memory. We don't have to context switch out if we might make uh, any kind of big call or deal with that. Any guarantee there is no paging? What's up? Any guarantee there is no paging? Uh, you can do a lock all and lock all support, so you can make sure it doesn't take out the disk. Um, you can run it without swap. You can do other things to make sure that you have tuned it right. Um, Otherwise, just make sure your configuration size. Yeah, be very, very very careful about the max byte. Observe your, your instances carefully and make sure that um, you know it's not crashing every once in a while or sec faulting or anything. Like where you're running into swaps. Be very be, keep that in mind. It's probably best practice to not actually, I, I believe this in general with MinCache-D and also with databases, is don't run them with swap. Um, frankly, you don't really want to run any of these things with swap enabled because what's going to happen is that, let's say let's say something goes out to swap. Uh, if it goes out to swap or pages out, your performance goes into the toilet, um, which means that what are you going to do? Try to S-log into the machine to fix whatever it was that went out to swap which probably means your, your connection is probably also going to be fighting for memory at the same time because the process is going to probably keep trying to go on, which just creates this environment where your prompt's dead ended and most likely you're probably going to end up running to the back of the machine or calling up the, calling up the, the data center and having to pull the plug on the machine and plug it back in. So my personal philosophy is just don't enable swap. I'll let that go. Yeah? Uh, you just mentioned the settings that you can use to make sure that there's a uh, There's a, a command line option uh, dash uppercase M, I think. Well, and it uses the M lock all, so it's called uh, run dash H, and it, it pretty much tells you what it is. Uh, but in general, if you don't enable swap on your machines, right. much better. And you also, there's problems occasionally with operating systems going haywire and deciding to swap out things when they really shouldn't be swapped out in the first place. So in general, just disable swap on computers. If uh, you might have, if you have an older kernel, like you run Red Hat Enterprise 3 or 4, uh, you might get into some cases without running swap, where the, the case swap feed process might start going up and start losing a lot of time. Uh, you, can, you don't have to enable uh, two gigs of swap. You might only need 100 megs. And that would be enough as if, uh, if you start swapping by accident, you can still run on a memory tool process. It won't take that box. But it'll mean if, if uh, 
if Linux wants to reorganize, if it really wants to move this 10 megabytes of data somewhere else for a moment, so we can free up some uh, pressure from the VM, we can have a little bit of leeway there. So if you can't deal with no swap, just build a little tiny one and hope you can deal with that. Uh, so the slot validator, every time you store an object, uh, I'll start it up. Start this way. When you, when every time you store an object, it will look at the size of the item you stored. It's 100 bytes. It'll say, I have a slot class that are 90 bytes, and I have a slot class that is 130 bytes. So you're going to go into the 130 byte slot class. And what that means is, at that point, you lose that extra 30 bytes. Uh, it'll pick the, class, the slot class that's closest to the actual size of your item, but it's not exact. You're not using that exact amount of memory. You're just taking a small chunk, a little slice off of a page. How granular are the classes? Like, what, what are the actual slot classes? So they slot, there's a factorial. Uh, there's a dash, dash f option to then cache d. You can specify the growth factorial. And what that basically is, uh, it takes the minimum object size, the minimum class size, which might be 100 bytes per data on And the maximum size is a megabyte. And then it will calculate the factor. The default factor it used to be 2, uh, 2.0. And so there was a fairly wide uh, distance between the different slot classes. But Stephen Grimm changed the, uh, the default to 1.2. So for you have 100, multiply that by 1.2, uh, fill it, buzz it, make sure it's memory aligned, keep going all the way up to a megabyte. And I usually create about 36, 39 slot classes for you. Um, and that's for the small objects, that's really granular and works pretty well. And when you get a really high objects, it starts to move a little bit so this, everything is, is segregated by slot class. So if you have 100 bytes, or if you have 100 bytes, 300 bytes, several different kinds of items, you're, you're going to be pulling memory into uh, each of these individual slot classes from the operating system. And that's a fairly hard thing to get the record head around, but basically it works like if you have two, if you start with a you say you have four gigs of memory. That means you have 4,000 uh, 4,000 possible slot pages you can have. So every time you store an object, store an object into, uh, if you start a link ID clean, store 100 bytes of memory, it'll, it'll go to its free pool from the OS, and it's 4 gigs free, pull a megabyte, put that into a 100 byte or 130 byte slot class, and cut that, slot, that uh, page up. So as a megabyte, will turn into however many, uh, however many uh, individual chunks that will fit your, your item class up into a megabyte, which is one chunk per page from the allocator. And this gives us the, the big trade-off here is that if you start with a cache and you store all of your items as 100, 100 bytes, and then you come along later and you start storing a lot of items as 500 bytes, you will, get, uh, you will start evicting memory like crazy. Because all of your pages were, were allocated over time from the operating system into the smaller slot classes. Uh, so this kind of it puts you into a little bit of a bind if you, if you push out a new, some new code uh, that uses that starts storing different size of item classes. You might actually have to go back and restart your MKHD cluster to kind of even out the pages a little bit. Uh, it used to give you out memory errors if you hadn't exercised that part of the slot allocator. You, if you allocated all of your memory to 500 byte classes and then you tried to store a megabyte, you'd say, nope, we got no room for that. Uh, that was fixed uh, quite a while ago. So you can go and you can store one or, or a couple, a handful of items in any slot class at any point in time in the work. You just won't have very enough memory available to you. And if you're, you're MKHD is fairly stable. For most people, it never crashes. It'll be up for a year at a time. So you have to kind of keep an eye on the evictions that, uh, that's going on. And also with the, with the recent release of 125, you can look at these evictions and out of memory errors per slot class. So if you can tell, you grab all of these individually and monitor them all individually. You can suddenly see that, hey, well, we pushed code on Tuesday, and now on Wednesday we're getting an awful lot of evictions in the 500k range. And you might restart your web server at that point. You might go yell at your developers for storing 500k objects at that point. Whatever you need to do, you have to keep an eye on it. And there was a little bit of work for being able to actually move slide classes that were empty around. Uh, there doesn't quite work. Uh, it was broken, so it didn't ever it was finished. We do intend to have uh, to have this fixed so that you can connect to MemCacheD and say, I'm getting eviction here, move 10,000 pages from, or a couple, thousand, a couple hundred pages from this slot class to another slot class. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, if I could drill down into a specific, say for the sake of argument, for a mobile app developer, and we're storing very small objects, like 8, 10, 12K. Is there a rule of thumb for configuring that minimum to get sufficient slot classes? Uh, well, you, what you can do, actually, is there's a, there's a command called stats sizes, I think. And what this does is it, it says, pretend you all of your slide classes were 32 bytes apart. Tell me exactly how many items are in each of these 32 byte slide classes. And you can look, you can, once your server's been running for a while, you can type stat sizes, be careful, it's slow, you can fix it yet. And it'll actually, it might lock up your instant for a second or two if you have a couple million items. Uh, but what it'll tell you is, uh, you have this cluster in a specific range of, of chunks, slot classes. And you can use that to change the factorial or recompile it with a smaller max. So if you have an embedded system and you know that you're never going to store an item above 20k, you can say, my max page size is 20 kilobytes and my factorial is 1.1. So there's a lot of granularity, a very small max, to keep your amount of slot classes down, make sure it doesn't waste memory if you're allocating that. You can even turn off the pre-allocator if you don't need it. So if you want to scale down, you can scale down with a little bit of, of source tuning. Thank you. Sure. Can, can you find your... Uh uh, classes, like uh, you can fill the junk, fill it up if you want. No. If you want to find out my exact sizes of my chunk, and then so can use some tricks to find those that so that the statement caps need to only create this kind of slot classes. Uh, well, you can you can't say you can't specify exact slot classes. But you can only specify the factorial. Um, I assume we could add that. It's not. It's uh, it would be a little weird getting the interface right. But it is, there's code there that it could just be very easily done. It's just a, it's just the slot classes are just an array. You can say this one's a state, this one's a state, and forth. So just to clarify, right now, if you want to adjust how the allocation works, you have to adjust the factorial in the source. You know, you can no, the factorial is a command line option. That's dash f. Okay. So if you want to change the granularity of your chunk, of your chunks, you just have to restart it. Do you have a maximum page size? Uh, max page size is in file Okay. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier about n to prepend. So if that gets beyond the size of the slot that's in a chunk, does it automatically move over to a larger one, or does it just get lost? Uh, append and prepend cheat. Uh, when you append an object, it actually allocates a new object off the slot of the new size, and then copies the data in, into it. So it'll kind of naturally, atomically, uh, promote your item through the slide classes until you run out of memory. And then if you, then at that point, if it tries to allocate a new item that's too big, the, paint, the slide allocator says, I can come for you, and it'll just bomb out uh, item too long, value too long. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Uh, I think I've actually covered everything in the slide. <laughs> one, thing that, uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned earlier, you can, by the way, set new cache deep to command line such that you will not uh, evict anything. You, so you can't actually disable the LRU. So if you want to control exactly what's in there and you never want to tell LRU uh, to come into play, there's actually a command line option that allows you to just disable the LRU. Objects you put in are in. If an object comes in, can't be stored, it'll actually be rejected for storage until you delete another object. So you can do that. You mentioned earlier that um, you have a, uh, like a time to live or a T block or whatever. <coughs> To tell it when to expire an object, does it automatically delete that object, or does it keep that object around the memory until something <coughs> comes in and needs that space and distance? Every single aspect of MKHD is asynchronous and lazy. So uh, the biggest, the biggest example of that is actually the flush command. When you say flush, all it does is it says the ex everything is expired if it is, if it is not older than a second ago, or zero seconds ago. So <laughs> the next time you do a get, if you get an item, it'll Go so look up the item, find it, check the expire time, and if it is uh, below the, the flush value, right. then it says uh, miss. And then what we'll do is we'll free it at that point back in the uh, slot chunk. The clock expiration is set by default. I don't think it <coughs> It's set by default to every second. So every second is when it goes through and checks exp uh, expiration. So once every second the clock tick, it goes through and sees, okay, what's been set to expire, and it'll pull out. So for instance, if you told an object to expire, it expired based on that deletion cycle of when it actually came through. Okay. Ex expiration is, is based on seconds, uh, full seconds. So you, you, say, you can't say store an item for 500 milliseconds. You store it for a full second, <laughs> you can say 
but the next time, internally to the server, it takes the tick off the, the tick callback to update the internal timer, and then you do a get on that, and then it says it's off there because it's fired. <coughs> or the next time you store an item, and it needs to free some memory to look at the expired item first. <coughs> yes? So let's say you deleted an object, it goes in for deleted list, and now you're out of memory, you put in another object, will it get rid of the LRU based object or go back to the deleted list and get? Uh, I, there is a deleted list, it is processed uh, asynchronously by timer, so it would actually evict from the LRU first if it is not gotten to that delete list. And it does that. Uh, <coughs> A little more asynchronously, in case you delete an item that is in use and is being transferred to another client. That's a little bit of an edge case. Um, but the, the delete timer happens every five seconds, I think. So a couple seconds later, everything you deleted is completely gone. And if you, the instant you delete something, you can never get it again. So you, you go delete something and the time will be gone, but it might not be in big at first. Well, once it is deleted, you couldn't go back in and read it again. So once it's deleted, it is gone. It may not have been recycled yet into the system, but when you call deletion, it, it is it is gone at that point. Yeah, so the, 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 the issue was that within those five seconds, you might have gotten rid of an object which was active, right, not yet expired. Right. Even when there were objects which were deleted and should have gotten rid of. Um, very, very unlikely, but yes. Okay. Thanks. By the way, was the break at 3.30 or was the break at, uh, what was the break at? Okay. We're going to the next step of the, of the uh, slide. So. <coughs> so what we're going to talk about is actually how the clients are put together. You'll probably get into some coding examples. So the first thing to talk about is actually hacking. <laughs> so inside of the drivers right now, the drivers all implement, of course, hashing on their own side. Now, the server is hashing to actually hash into its own given hash table internally, but the clients are also using a hash to distribute out uh, the given data. Now, hashing comes in basically two flavors, normal hashing, which is modula, and then consistent hashing. Uh, at this point, most of the major drivers, well, I don't know if that's true, at least a few of the major drivers support consistent hashing at this point. Um, everybody supports a normal hashing form. And by normal hashing, I mean they take a given value and run some type of hashing algorithm on it, turn that, and then do a modular divide against the number of servers and place the object. That's the simplest form of hashing that is actually used in the clients. What we see in the clients is a number of hashing algorithms today. Anything from, let's see, by default, we know that all drivers today support uh, CRC, CRC uh, in exactly the same way. So usually people say, hey, I need a, you know, I need a hashing algorithm that allow a uh, C client and a Perl client and a Java client to all find the same objects. And usually the answer is CRC today, so we know that. Um, they also support pretty much all four forms of F and B. They form heist. They form the default one I never can remember the name of. Uh, what's the default one inside of the cache key? Yeah, um, it's the common one that heist usually replaced. Uh, Murmur was recently added for those of you who like to look at uh, Murmur. Uh, which is a, a, fast, a fast algorithm that tends to distribute well. It was actually a uh, kind of open source from Microsoft. Um, and uh, that's just a few of the ones. In consistent hashing, we don't do a modular divide, but instead we distribute across some type of circle or a wheel. And uh, here's my attempt at bad art, actually how this is done. <coughs> Notice it doesn't even arrange very well. Uh, one of the marketing guys in my school will get a hold of this and turn it into something useful, thankfully. Um, but what in this case what we do is we do a consistent hash. And a consistent hash means that instead of doing a modular divide, instead we actually look at sometimes a predetermined and sometimes a calculated wheel of servers. And by doing this, we interlace uh, data across many servers across the network. Now the advantage of doing a consistent hash is this. We can add in a server into the network and we don't lose uh, a major portion of the network. If you look at it mathematically from a modular side, if you're using a modular distribution, every time you add in a server into a given network of servers, you're going to miss some fairly large percentage of the entire data inside the cache. 
This is less of a problem when you have two, more of a problem when you have a hundred. Because you have a hundred servers running, you want to be able to add in a server into, this, into the environment without actually losing the entire cache network at once. Okay, it's standing up. So. The, uh, the other thing it also allows you to do is stuff like where the memcached can actually do replicas. So what it'll do is actually take this network of servers and it'll apply data to multiple <coughs> servers across the ring. All the clients can have access to that. So if a server is taken out of the network, then it can always find the data in a second in a second server in the network. Or if a server is added to that, the redistribution around the ring still allows it to find all the old data. So basically you can keep these networks up and running and just keep throwing servers at it and keep growing the network and not have to worry about every time you add a server, you lose your entire cache coherency. Because usually most sites that typically tend to be designed around read-through uh, read uh, cache designs tend to pretty much go to the shitter once you, you blow out the cache network on it. So via consistent hashing, you can actually avoid all of that. Some people use simple workarounds for this. If you have uh, the, the most common case for dealing with this is if a cache server dies completely, you need to bring up a new one or replace one. And uh, what some companies do is they just they use a, the actual IP address of the server is something that's replaceable, so they bring up a new server that replaces that exact IP address. And that saves you a little bit again if you don't have a client that comes to so. Yeah. When a client makes a connection, when you have a new client and it connects, does it get a list of all of the hashes from each server? How does it know where something exists? Good theater question, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, because Patrick actually knows the answer to this, so the drivers themselves today work based on feeding them the number of, feeding them the actual host network itself. So like we said before, there is no master server sitting here that says to a client when it comes up, these are all the servers in the network. Now some people design that on top of the drivers, but by default that doesn't actually exist. So for the client, and we'll see this when we get into the coding examples, the clients are just said, here's a set of hosts, go and execute against these hosts. Now, on that same question, there's a second part to your question, what was it? The <coughs> Did they obtain a list of... Right. Now, how they obtain that list, we've seen different things. I've seen people actually push the list of hosts inside of MCACHD, so when a client connects up, it'll actually grab the list and pull itself and then execute it. So usually it knows like a, some kind of a, a, a primer host to pull data. Uh, there's libketema, which is used sometimes to pull data off the disk, which was done by the last FM folks. Um, how do they do it by journal? Uh, push to the config file. Okay. So they just put a config file on disk, I assume, and pull it every so often? Yeah, every uh, LDA config dot PM or PL or whatever, and you list all of your servers in there, you list your hash, you use inconsistent hash, and every time you, if you want to change the list of servers, we push out, we push out the file to all the web servers and 10 seconds later we reload the data. So the thing to know is that clients don't just automatically know that the host of memcached servers exist. Though I actually do think about pushing a patch for zero comp, which would solve that. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> zero comp works. Eh. Anyway, so this is what you see as far as the consistent hash work goes. So, any questions about that as far as how that would be done? Yeah. So each client like right now you implement this separately, or they all pretty much implement. Uh, you mean the hashing algorithms or the or the. Um, Pretty much all of them, when we get into the actual coding example, you'll see most of them have some type of API that says feed me a new server. And so most of them work about the same. But as far as them consistently reading from the same source to pull back uh, information on the network, that doesn't exist today. Um, yeah, no, that doesn't exist today for any of the, 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 the consistent hashing algorithms between clients are close. Uh, there's no standard. We've tried to standardize a couple times, but there were discussions, and I don't think anybody really cared about to fix it. Uh, the actual, the standard server hashing algorithm is standard. So if you have, if you don't use consistent hashing and you use multiple uh, drivers in different languages, you will usually get the same, uh, the same hash result when you're looking at servers. So the two solutions, if you've got multi-language issues to grab stuff out of MCACHD, uh, is one, um, we know that all the primary drivers today support the same, that their CRC implementation, and so if you select CRC as the hashing algorithm, then Everybody actually knows where all the objects are, so that's one way to do it. At least if, we actually at least know that the 
main, main, one of the main curl ones, one of the Python does, the Ruby, uh, uh, Dustin Spaulding's uh, Java driver, the Mincash D, all of their CRC implementations are dead on. So if you need to find the same hashing piece, you can pick CRC. Uh, another solution is that libmimcached has a number of language wrappers around it. So if you just use libmimcached with its Python wrapper or the Perl wrapper or whatever wrapper, then because they all use the same server logic via libmimcached, they all access exactly the same uh, the same network. And today, libmimcached has language bindings for all major languages except Taylor hasn't pushed the Java one out to many people to use, and the Lua one hasn't ever been completed. But as far as Perl and Python and Ruby go, they're all exactly the same. Can you talk a little bit about the dead memcached servers, like the memcached instance goes down? What happens with the consistent hash here? So this is a little bit up to the, the we go back to the fact that the server itself is stupid. The server doesn't know much. So really it goes back into, what exactly does the client library do? So I can talk about libmin cached. Can we talk about Peckle or you know Peckle well enough? Sure. Okay. So in libmin cached, if you're using the new replicate code, the server goes down. So we have server A and B. If your data is stored on A and B, we would go and check this server. If this server was down, there's a timeout that's done that's uh, it can be controlled in the client as far as how fast it does, or you can do a multi-get and it'll get data from both. What it'll do is it'll look at the client and say, okay, you're dead, I'll go over to B. So it'll immediately fail over to B and pull the data from B. Or if it goes to A and says not found, what it does is it still goes to B because it doesn't know if that other server has bounced during that period of time and has come up. One of the nice things with memcached is it being a cache, when the server goes down and the server comes back up, you don't have to worry about stale data because, well, there's no data sitting in there. Network partitioning is still problematic, so I would suggest you don't have your sysadmins rip cables out of the back of computers in your network. Uh, at least on your live computers. So that, that is still actually a, an unsolved problem. We have, a, we have an algorithm that we haven't implemented yet that allows if you have three servers to determine which actually was the correct data, but that's not done yet. But so today, you go in, you fetch data out of that. You can If that fails or it gets not found, it'll check the second server. And today, you can do both asynchronously if you want to and pick back the fastest one. Um, that should be in the dot .20 version of the driver that's coming out probably the next week or two. So that's how Libmin Cache D can handle it. Many of the drivers built on top of it. If you don't have set for doing replication of data, then it's just a cache miss if it's if it's if it's a dead instance. Yeah, in any of these cases, if you if you're not using replicate, then if the cache if the, the data that if the server that held the data is gone away, the data is gone away into cache miss. Okay. I mean, the thing to implement in cache D is is always assume it's a cache. Don't think of it as a primary store. Um, at some day when, and we'll talk about a roadmap when durable stores are, you can think about it differently. But today you should think of it as a cache. Think of it as a read-through design. If you think of it as anything else in a read-through design, you're probably going to cause yourself some pain. And how does Peckle work? Um, Peckle has actually been making the Perl client library, the original pure Perl library as well. So Peckle, uh, a long time ago, when, and this was first, or the client was still fairly young, the default operation to do, uh, what the server was detected as down is to effectively take it out of the pool. So if a server, if you have three memcaches and the ABC and the server C goes away, if the client effectively looked at it as if you only had two at that point, it would redistribute your keys. And they figured out fairly soon, fairly quickly, that that was actually really stupid because you have the, this original problem that consistent hashing and all these other things are trying to solve, but every single time the server flaps, half your keys become invalid instead of just that specific portion. So Peckle, uh, Perl, and most of the other client libraries uh, have changed their defaults or have an option for changing it to don't actually fail over the cluster, don't actually collapse the list if the server dies. So if you have three memcached Ds and one of them goes away, you end up, uh, until you replace that server, uh, add another one in the, the list or bring another one up with the same IP address or add a consistent hash. That amount of time that is down, you have one third of your one third of your get was missed. So it'll have one third extra cache misses. And if you can't really handle that, you can just add more memcached Ds. The more memcached Ds you have, the less of an effect or impact on your cycle will have if one goes down, as long as you can handle the cache misses, which if you're treating it as a cache, you should be able to. Yes? Does it remember that it's down for every request, or did you make another request later? There's a customized timeout. 
So if a server is dead, you won't retry it for a couple seconds. Or it might uh, have a back off, sometimes the back off. So if it dies, you'll try a second later, and we'll try five seconds later, and maybe top off at 15. Yes? In terms of failures, uh, if the client like right, last has something, and the server was down, or the network had failed, and a later time it worked, uh, what do we deal with that situation, given that the remove might have failed, but the subsequent get, which might have failed later, would have worked? Don't buy cheap switches. <laughs> Sorry. That, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah if, you're, if your network's unreliable, your network's unreliable. I, I had heard, a, I think there's stories out of Facebook out of them when they first started doing this, actually crashing switches. Because um, it turns out that the manufacturers hadn't really thought about this much data flowing through them at, at the rate that it did. So um, you can't actually overflow a switch, it turns out, especially in the UDP protocol. So, but yeah, intermittent, intermittent hasn't been solved yet. We've got a, we've got a solution inside of the Moon Catch D that's going to allow us to do that when we, we want to tear up and use up a lot of memory. We can use a, a three basically where two guarantee, two guarantee success, one doesn't. So, but that's actually not in the tree at this point. We're still waiting to actually uh, pull it in. And once that's available, it'll be available to all the Perl and other libraries. Any more questions about consistent hashing? So, other things to know uh, about this before we uh, let you guys go for break. The other things to be thinking about apply is multi-get versus single get. A lot of the client, a lot of the client protocols, clients today can do multi-gets. Um, Memcached works much better when it can actually stack multiple operations inside the same packet. So, a lot of the protocols, when you start picking drivers, start thinking about multi-get versus single get. If you have eight keys that you need at once, firing off those eight keys through most of the clients, most of those can actually optimize that into one large packet transfer to the server or sets of multiple packet transfers to the servers. So they'll fetch back data uh, much more quickly. The same thing goes to deletion. There's a, most of the, a lot of the optimizations uh, around the C driver have all been built into figuring out how to handle batched operations together and batch as many operations together as possible. So a, a good example of this, as you're scaling out MemCached, uh, say you do, you have a get, uh, you write your first client, your first example code, your first page, and you have 10 individual gets. And you realize, you use the profile and you realize that each one of these gets is doing a network round trip that costs about a millisecond, and it adds up, uh, you, know, you really want your page to be rendered for 30 milliseconds. So if you're doing 10 round trips, that's going to be a 15 millisecond loss right there. You don't want to do that. So then you start to switch to multi-get. So all your keys together, you send out one packet to the server and that's great. And then you have 10 servers. And once you have 10 servers, you might send that list to your driver. So you can tell your driver, I want these 10 keys. And the driver says, well, this key hashes out to server A, this one hashes out to server B, and so forth and so on. And it actually still sends 10 packets. So we'll try to do it uh, as asynchronously as possible, but then we can actually do a lot better about that. And it will still suck a little bit. Uh, so there's some there's some tricks you can do around that. So the best example I can think of off the top of my head uh, is if you're looking at a user profile. You go to Live Journal and you click profile with a bunch of little information tidbits there. There's your your, your IM contact info, your, your email address, your birthday, your biography, a bunch of little crap. And it would be really cool if you can send one big get request and get all these little items that you might still cache individually all together at once. And what you do is you actually say, this, this key, since there is since there's actually a disassociation with, uh, between the client and the server for what their hash tables are, you can actually tell your client driver that these keys that I'm going to store and deal with are hashed based on this user ID. So all of these keys are related to each other by the user ID. So the key is actually user ID Frank or user ID 5. And what that will do is when the client goes out to hash and figure out what server it is, this one user, all of their data will be in the one place, you know, a big, big multi-get request, and come back very fast, you can be able to log servers. Uh, Quick word of warning on that, if you're just doing that on MemCached, you don't pass that same logic through my seat. Right, if you do a big batch get on something that maybe uh, you're, you're doing this because of their slow queries, and you batch up data and slow queries together, you, that might hurt, and your DBA or the DBA might show up. Yes. Uh, so there's a really good overreaching point with MemCached is that it doesn't actually make your database faster. So if you write really awful queries, they're still going to be awful. 
because it's only going to take 10 minutes to repopulate your cache. And if you have a query that will take a minute to populate a cache, and it's on the web page, and that cache, uh, cache expires, you might have a race where all of your web servers are running this really awful query at the same time. But the good news is, is that if you write really bad queries using mcached, you don't actually run them as often. So there is a, a side, <laughs> there is a side to this. Um, so if you're looking for defensive programming against bad DBAs yeah. or bad database people, there might be a solution somewhere in there for you. Use gear man, get a little better on top of that. Yeah. So at this point, uh, the uh, you should go out. Yeah, I think in two minutes they'll put out coffee. The rest of the talk has to do with us showing code examples of how to actually program in Ruby and Perl and Python, I think Python, and C and everything else. So I would suggest drinking lots of coffee before you get back in the room because we now get into code and that usually puts people to sleep. So thank you very much and see you in, uh, what is it, half an hour or see you guys in a half an hour. Okay, so they're closing the doors so you can't escape. Everybody got coffee, right? Okay. Yeah, coffee, good. So, uh, let's see. So, anyway, we're going to start off. So, first half of this is examples. Second half, second part of this, we're going to go into some cool stuff. And third, we'll be talking about some roadmap pieces. Um, so, we've taken a few different languages. Unfortunately, when we asked for the mailing list for Python, no one responded to Python. So, any of you Python lovers, you should send a thin wall made of cache mail list and mail and stuff. So, cool. so anyway, uh, now I'm going to start this showing off some Ruby. And our goal of this is not only to show you, in, not to teach you obviously Ruby, but to kind of show you how the languages are all kind of similar in the way that they work. So when you learn the concept on one driver, for the most part you're in good shape about learning the concepts in other drivers. So uh, to begin this off, I'm going to talk about Ruby. Okay, uh, how many people here use Ruby? Great. I noticed I didn't raise my hand, so I apologize if I get anything just wrong. Uh, so we'll start off, uh, all these examples usually start off pretty simple, very basic, how you load the, load the driver, start using the driver, whatever. So we have, uh, there's no hash bang, so we can't say exactly what we're in the or whatever. But the very standard required memcache. So if you have the memcache gem installed, or uh, however you install it, probably be a gem. Uh, it will load the driver at that point, and then you have uh, memcache dot, uh, the, the memcache object is now exposed to you. You can start adding servers, you can start creating clients, and get set and so forth. And every client that you're going to see has this little server list. And obviously this guy has got two locally running instances, it's just a little test, test ticky. But that's a, a, an array, and then you just pass the array uh, to New clause that really I'm trying to expand on the slide a little bit. There's really nothing here. Uh, the the namespace <laughs> option is, is an interesting uh, trick that we haven't actually talked about yet. Uh, so you, you pass the list of servers. You, you want to get an object that you're going to be interacting with memcache with from that point from that point forward. Uh, so a trick people usually use is if you have a shared memcache instance, if you have four different Rails applications that you're running. You can them all into the same pool of memcache keys, but you don't want their keys to interact. What you can do with some clients is you can set a generic namespace. And what this does is it prepends all of your keys, with, in this case, my underscore app, colon, and then whatever your key is. So this means that in general, no matter what, no matter what else you're running on this instance, you won't collide with your key names. And that's pretty useful for, for some certain design patterns. You have lots of little bit fairly independent applications running on the same set of servers. It can be pretty handy. Uh, also, if you want to expire all of your caches just to that specific application, but not for the rest of the application, you can change the namespace value. And that's that's really one of the magic magical moments of the LRU. You can say, my namespace is now my app too. And suddenly you have a very clean instance because everything that everything you store now will just overwrite all of my apps which aren't going to be depressed anymore when you're looking for my app too. And that's as much as I can move this life. Uh, to get started, very, very simple. All the languages are going to look pretty much the same. Uh, key equals recent posts, posts equal cache get key. If you don't, if you don't get, uh, at that point, it actually looks at the driver. The driver looks at that list, has to the key, <coughs> the key, and key, returns it. It will give you a nil value, which is null in all the languages, um, if it's not found. 
And then if it's not found, you want to actually do your database query. So this is the most common design pattern with Memcached D, is you look for a key. If you don't got the key, you look in the data store. Database, Cached DB, MySQL, Postgres, whatever. Find your data, return, uh, set the key in, and then return the data to your user. So the next time that code is executed, you will actually have a cache. And when you set the key, uh, and here you have set, cache, set, key, post 60. What that means is you want to set your key, uh, it will be recent post. Post is the value that is going to marshal then and insert. And then 60 is the amount of time to cache for. There's also a flag value that's not usually exposed to the client. But, so for the next 60 seconds, you're going to see exactly this in the database. And that means that for the next 60 seconds, unless the cache goes away, you're going to see that same value. So you need to keep that in mind. And one of, the other, one of the other common design patterns is actually uh, as you update your posts. So if you, you have a, something like this, structured like this, where you're, you're doing it for an individual post, you would say uh, cache, get, key, whatever, whatever, whatever. In the actual post part, you, when you write the post in, you actually at that point set the key. So you take that second part, if it was an insert, post, stop, create, or whatever, uh, you would then insert the key at that point. So the next time the get comes around, he doesn't ever talk to the database. You insert into the database, you know what your post looked like at that point in time, and it's not going to change. So it also means you can cache it for much longer. So every time that post changes, if you go back and edit your post, you can you can cache the key for four hours. Just to be safe in case you get sale. You can cache it for four hours. When you go and update that post, you instantly get a fresh cache, and your users are happy. And that's pretty much it. One thing that Alan mentioned, by the way, is that notice that he said you would test for the value, that you would actually test for um, nil as a value. Um, Memcached D can store zero link objects. So if you want to say a key and you want to pass in the value of zero for the operation, it can store zero link objects. You can use this to do testing of ping and some other things. But so it's always important not only to look at the value that it returned, but to also just determine that null, well, zero, may be a credible value um, actually from the server. And most of the drivers, in the C1, I can actually show you how you test for this, but most of the drivers have a concept that allow you to understand that. By the way, you did get a zero relink return value, and that was an actual value instead of just a, uh, instead of just a, we didn't find any. This is a, a little longer, complete example of another fairly popular but a little on the obscure side design pattern. So one interesting issue that I brought up a little bit earlier of is if you have a cache, that, a cache key that expires and you have a very busy website, you're getting 500 requests per second, which is actually not that busy in relative terms, but it's pretty damn fast. And every single page load loads this one key and all of a sudden the key expires or disappears and then you have 500 processes all trying to regenerate this key at once. What you can do is you have this, uh, I call this the ghetto lock, and it's, it's even commented as such up there, it's a ghetto locking situation, and it uses a side effect of one of the atomic commands in memcached to create a pseudo lock around the process. So what you, what you get is if you, if you end up wanting to uh, add a key or if you want to generate a key and you want to make sure you're the only process that's processing this area, you can go to memcached and say, I'm going to add key lock. And this is one of the cases where you would actually be testing, ensuring that you're testing for nil instead of zero, because that lock doesn't actually need to contain anything. You can just say that you're testing for the existence of this lock. So the code goes through and ensures that uh, if nothing, if, it's, if uh, your process dies, or it times out or it can't get its data, that after 30 seconds somebody else will, will have a chance to do that. So that's the lock expired. And then if you're trying to get the lock, you can retry and loop a good couple times before getting up. But you're not actually running those computations. You might be hanging a little bit, but you're not badgering your database with these huge queries. So you go in and you add the lock. And if the lock is stored, what uh, it means the add worked. And add will only work if there is no key there existing at that point. <coughs> And add to become a step. If you want to, a step will overwrite everything, a replace will also overwrite everything. It's not really very widely used, but an add will only store if there was nothing there. So at that point, you got it, and you can give the, uh, you can give the, uh, the key back to the closure if you're 
you're familiar with the Peruvian, I won't try to explain it too, get too much into that. Uh, but then, at that point, you do your computation. So you're, you're safe, you have your log, you go talk to your database, you run a minute long query or a 30 second long query. We would hate you if you did that, please don't. But if you run your query, you run your database statistics, you add it in, you set your cache key, and then you issue a delete to the log. And as soon as you delete the log, uh, anybody else can go update the key again. But you're ensuring and with some relative, relative assurance that it, uh, you only have one process working on this at any one time. So then you want to delete the key, but if the delete fails, sometimes you can do that if you have a crappy network. Um, if the code crashes at this point, you still, you're still okay because the log expired. For 30 seconds, you'll free up and something else will be able to, to figure it out. And if you want to bounce around in the loop, Try at that point in time, could not apply our lock. Uh, you probably, so this is still fairly straightforward, it's just a couple of ifs, insurers, whatever. In the insure in that lock, if you're not familiar with Ruby, ensure that if you return a value, if you're done processing and you have an insured lock, that lock will always get run as well. So you can say ensure that you delete the lock and you bomb out of this. If you bomb out while you're processing earlier, you do delete your lock. You don't have to uh, ensure that every single time, you, every single point where you handle a database error, you also issue a delete. You just write ensure and it does it. It's great. It's one of the wonderful things about how uh, terse Ruby is. Uh, also, if, if you're, this is a little more real world example. This is getting a little, this slide is already fairly huge. Uh, you would be testing within your, within your retry loop for existence of this key or whatever your result is. So if you're retrying and waiting for it to be built, you could also check, come back and check and say, oh, well, this, my key didn't build in the meantime. If it has been, you can return back to your client. So during the sleep part, you can sleep two seconds, get the key that you're looking for, and if it exists, you return that and stop sleeping. If it doesn't exist, maybe the other guy died, you want to keep retrying, you have to log and try again. And this is not, uh, sorry? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so we'll get back to him in a minute. Um, so this is not actually a guaranteed mutex lock. This is a ghetto lock, and I want to really, really emphasize that. This is really ghetto. If memcached goes away, this is not, in any case, 100% guaranteed that you only have one process for mutex at any point in time. You can add CAS operations to make it a little safer, but it is not, it's not an actual, uh, like, uh, the analog in MySQL would be select get lock, select release lock, it is not that safe. It is relatively safe, and it's also really, really fast. So there are a lot of cases for a lot of websites where you can use this to really get a lot, um, get very far with it. And that's pretty cool. I don't know if uh, raised the issue that this locking algorithm works much better if your cache hasn't already expired. So in other words, you have some data that you've stored, you ran a query that maybe takes a second or two, and you have 500 processes every single time, they're going to be trying to load that information from Memcache. By the time if it expires out of Memcache, they're all still going to need that data. So if you have a way in your application to be able to detect when the data is stale and I need to refresh it, then you can use this lock operation and say, okay, I have a lock, so use the stale data while I'm building and refreshing. That way you don't have all of your instances creating an unreferred on your database. Okay, that's a great point. Uh, wish I had another example after this that was advanced. So I'm just going to launch into this. Imagine that this is a lot longer code. It goes right down to the floor. It's going to explain something a little more complex. And what you do is you can, you can store whatever the hell you want in your objects. If you have a flat key, if you have a, a configuration file that you're loading, and that configuration file is used on every single request, and you want to ensure that you're only going to pop, repopulate this config information from one server with a lock. What you can do is you can say, well, I've got my config file. I'm going to store this in, a, in an array. And the first item in the array is going to be a reference to this config object. The second item in the array is going to be uh, the soft time. <coughs> so you, you pick a, a time in the future, so I want to catch this board setting value for half an hour, or an hour, 3600 seconds. So you say 3600 seconds is the real expired time of the key. And then you say in the soft time, <coughs> you say you look inside the object, this guy is half an hour. So after half an hour, Every single time you load your object, you check this soft, this soft timeout. And uh, if the soft timeout is, is too old, your application can make a decision at that point and says, I'm going to pick a random number between one and a million. 
and I'm going to weight this based on how old the object is. So uh, you can get a little fancy with that. So if your object is, is half an hour old, one in a million chance, you will actually go and re-update it ahead of time. And if you, it is 45 minutes old, you maybe have a one in a thousand chance of going to the database and fetching it ahead of time and refreshing this object. So what that means is you don't ever end up in a situation where the object is gone. You are proactively into a little bit of a trick by just abusing the marshalling that's magically happening for every object you put in there. You're ensuring that you're, you're caching ahead of time for a very hot objects. And this can mean almost like or death scenario with some websites. You can spend, you can entirely lock up your site waiting for this cache key to be built. Uh, if you're not careful, and you can use very simple, relatively simple tricks like this just by abusing, or I guess it's not really abusing, it's just overusing uh, the features of MemCached and what you're able to store to add a little bit of extra data. Uh, that's a longer example that's not actually there. Perl is my other favorite language that I actually know. Uh, how many people here still use Perl? <coughs> Very happy. I love Perl. When we were talking about getting this tutorial in on my session, they were asking, can you, can you do it in Ruby, can you do it in PHP? I said, well, it makes me sad, but yes, I can. Uh, so Perl is a wonderful Swiss Army team song. Of course, it has MCACHP libraries. It has a pure Perl library, which is very easy to set up, very portable. Uh, there's a wrapper that works pretty well that I think Tim Bunce wrote for, um, around the MCACHP. And there's also Cash and Cash Fast and a few other clients. So very well supported. And say you just a very, very simple example, I'm showing you the same basic design pattern as is in the original Ruby slide. Is if you have you have a class that you initialize somewhere else. So in this case, some other part of your code is initialized a shared MCAT object that's sitting or just some overall class that you, you call in and on at some point. You swipe your library, you pull your big data file, you pull your server list, and you connect it. And at this point, you just get, you know, shift your foo, uh, look, for, look for the key, and you, there's a namespace in the example there too, foo, uh, foo ID. So it's appending the key to this namespace, uh, which is called foo. And you can do, you can do, of course, more fancy things with that. You can have individual namespace parts of your code, you can use a uh, more dynamic key to uh, dynamically expire. You can make that very granular. You can actually say per user, their stuff is actually prefixed with the user ID in a version. So if you are very, very lazy at spying your cache, you don't really want to spend a lot of brain cycle on it, you can say every single time that I want to blow all the cache for this one specific user, I'm going to change this namespace value. You might store that in another key somewhere. It's getting a little, a little more advanced. But otherwise, the rest of it is fairly straightforward. You select a row, you set it in, you return the object if you have it. Yes? Actually, the library Tim Bunch wrote is a very low level library, the Brian's library, and Docsify and Makai. So it's cache, memcache, colon, colon, libmemcache, which uses Tim Bunch's library. And all you have to do is change that in your use statement and then in your instantiation, and your code can use that. The all, I think all of the clients actually are fairly compatible uh, with the original cache and cache D interface. The pure Perl library is, is cache home home and cache D. And there's cache home home and cache D fast. And I actually don't know what the, don't call it the uh, lib cache D is. Cache, mem cache, home home, lib mem cache. There you go. Cache home home, mem cache. Home, home, you can use the low level one, but it doesn't have all the nice storable stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, you can just go iterate, iterate with it, just like uh, work with it, just like you would with Brian's library, except for in Perl. Same exact calls. The nice thing is, if you don't necessarily need to be using storable and you're just using byte arrays, even in Perl, <coughs> you can actually then just directly deal with it and not go through the storable piece. So you can kind of cut up that overhead. Yeah. So PHP. So uh, PHP is. I hate this language. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, how many people want to get to PHP right about now? <laughs> how many people use, uh, use PHP right now? Yeah. There we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but it, this is also very well supported, probably the best supported uh, language. So there's several C libraries for it. There's many, many pure libraries of different features. Uh, 
Uh, there's a fairly standard library, a uh, Heckle uh, Memcache library. <coughs> if you that standard, works fine. Uh, there'll be a little Memcache you want, and it'll probably uh, take over most of its features. Uh, we're not quite there yet. So for now, looks pretty simple. Cache equals new Memcache, you have your cache object, and at that point you can add service. It's a little more uh, object oriented in this interface than the Pro example, the Ruby example was even. Uh, Ruby also has add server, Perl has add server, but there are different, there are different ways to invoke this. You can say cache equals new memcache and list of servers, or you can say cache equals new memcache and then add server, add server, add server, add server, depending on how you're getting data. And then again, the same use pattern. This is probably pretty boring at this point, but hopefully within all these languages, we're getting at least all of you, or most of you, with uh, something that looks a little closer to home. So if not user cache, get user key, cache set user key value in the mold expire. Uh, I don't actually recall off the top hand if this is testing for null properly. So this might uh, actually fail on zero. Well, let's see. Yeah, at this point would, uh, yep, it failed. <laughs> but actually the, uh, who, what, what company did this come from? I don't know. Eva? Eva? No, Chris. Chris. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Yahoo. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, Yahoo. Uh, anyway, so the uh, what he's talking about. Notice here is that if dollar sign user get if there was a zero link user, which maybe they just don't even have in the code, this whole code would actually fail. So it's kind of an interesting uh, catch for me too. By the way, you'll notice something in here, and I'll, I'll be able to talk about it a little more in the C driver. You'll notice the expire. When you go to set an object, you can actually say, I don't want the object to exist for a certain period of time. So it's not that you have to rely on the LRU. So you don't have to wait there and say, wait for it to be kicked out. You can actually say, you know what? I only want you to exist for 10 minutes. So if you don't come back in 10 minutes, just blow it away. So if you're doing it with like a shopping cart or something where you only want to exist for a period of time or some kind of security piece, you can actually say 10 minutes, 10, you know, 10 seconds, this is as long as this key actually exists inside of Memcache D. So you can specify that. And there's a few more things else you can specify, but I don't know if all the other drivers support it, so I'll talk when we get to the C interface. Yeah? And that's where it comes back to the every five seconds here or so it goes through and actually purges the things that you told it to expire. Because it's not actively purging. It does not actively it, it, It's lazy in that uh, if you ask for a key that has been expired, it will not give it to you. It will look up the key, it will check the expire at that point of the get, and then say you're expired. Or if you're setting a value and you're out of memory, you will look at the keys that were least recently used that are, uh, that are expired. So we'll say, uh, this is the least recently used key that is expired, you go out and you reclaim its memory. Or if you were the least recently used key, you are out of expired items, and then it will start digging into the memory that's already been, that has not been expired. But if you're asking, can you fetch the object, if you set this object for 10 seconds and you come in at 12 seconds, will the object still be there? No, the object will be gone. Yeah, the object may or may not actually have been recycled into the pool, but as far as a get is concerned, it's gone. So there's no way to retrieve the object after that period, but does the object potentially still exist inside of the server? The answer is yes. Yes? So with expire, let's say you said no expire and you're relying on LRU, but something is queried frequently, mm -hmm. and the data in the database has changed, um, will it actually stay cached as long as people are requesting it? Yes, you need to, uh, if you do that, if you, set, if you set an item to never expire, you have to update it when you update that item. So if you have uh, okay. a user, uh, if you have a username, username will never change unless the user goes and clicks rename user. Cache that forever. In your code where you have a rename user, you need to set that key again. And you, still, you can do that, you have to kind of be careful because the set may fail if your application crashes and then it will be out of date for a while. Um, it works okay. You've also got the, uh, by the way, this is a set operation. Deletion operations also have a, a time set on them. Uh, the same thing I believe also with flush as well. So for instance, you can actually call delete and say I want you to delete in 60 seconds. And the object will actually persist for 60 seconds. So it can still be get and, and anything else. But in 60 seconds it will go away. So just because you, you set an object doesn't mean you can't come back in and update the expiration value on it. 
It's already just one other point, just in case. I don't think it's already been mentioned. The expiry time can be <laughs> relative or absolute. So you can say 60 seconds, or you can say expire on the 31st of December, whenever, if you set a high enough. Yes, if you expire, it's one of those magical values. You set it to be. That's you set an expire value that looks. Now. It's, Something it's, like it's that. fairly high. Uh, so if you set a value that is obviously a week from now, it'll say maybe, or uh, a couple of years from now, it'll say maybe you're thinking in dates. It actually set the expire time as a specific date, a specific time relative to now. So there is some magic involved in the actual expiration of time. And it's completely undocumented. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even sure what it's set at, like, Paul, do you have any idea? Hang on. Okay. It's really high. Yeah. So, uh, next one. Um, counter value. So this is an example of increment, finally. Uh, <coughs> 30, 30 days. days. <coughs> oh, sorry, 30 days. 30 days, okay. Anything less than 30 days is relative. Anything over it takes it as... So anything over, over, th uh, over 30 days in seconds is considered a date, anything under 30 days is considered relative. Uh, so in this example, we have increment. Increment does not identify a key. So if you don't have, uh, you have to do it again on the keys. If it fails, you do a set or an add. Uh, in this case, you probably want to do an add, so you don't overwrite the access of overwriting uh, an increment for key that was already there. And then, if it already exists, or, uh, yes, if it already exists, then you can increment the counter. Uh, the default, so the, there's an option you can actually pass to this. Default, if you call increment on a key, it'll just bump it up by one. But you can actually uh, bump it up by more than that. So if you say, uh, I'm incrementing this value by set to 500, you could say increment counter key comma 500, and the, the setting will be 500 instead of one. If you're doing a batch processing job, you're trying to implement a counter on a website, or if you're looking for a uh, common implementation of increment, is a flood counter. If you have, uh, if you want to write an automatic web crawler defender, defeater, or other thing, you can have a counter that is set to each combination of IP address and user rating, and then automatically after the counter it ends up at 50 over so many seconds, just blow them up to nine for, for 30 minutes. Say, so Memcached D has decided that you're annoying, go away. The thing to know about it, by the way, is that the Along with increment, there's actually a decrement. So just like you can increment a key, you can also decrement a key, and you can set that same expiration on, decre on decrement. So you can say decrement by 30 or decrement by whatever. So there is a corresponding from an increment, there's also a decrement. So you can use that as an, I've seen that used as object counters. So people will say, oh look, I have a reference to that. Oh, I don't have a reference to that. So that's another thing to know about. And this is, all the clients have some way of getting at the stack information too. So if you want to build a, a, a dashboard web page that will show you, uh, we'll iterate all of your, over all your MPIP servers and then look at the stacks. You have a, you can say cache equal to add server, add a single server, iterate through each of them from the list, and say get stats, extended stats, I'm not sure know what that does, the PHP will probably query stack items, stack row, and then Flush, the, the example of other commands. It's also quick version, some minor ones. Um, but flush is about the introduction apparently. Flush does what <coughs> flush by the way can also be set for a time, I believe. Yes, yeah, so you can say uh, flush in the future, you can get a, a value, so you go across all of the SDs and you say, I want you to all flush uh, relative to this time. Or I want to just be staggered into different times. So I'm going to tell you, tell you all the flush right now, but you're actually the first one I talk to is going to flush in 15 seconds. The second one I talk to is going to flush in 45 seconds. The third one I talk to is going to flush in five minutes. So as they as they flush, you get a little bit of time to recover, uh, or you can have them all flush at once if you're really mad at your website. And yes. So 
that if you want to put, so the question is, if you want to flush uh, a specific kind of cache, if you have a per user cache, if you have a shopping cart cache, you want to flush everything relative, relevant, uh, relative to that user, relative to that cart, you can do that via uh, a namespace trick, which we started talking about a little earlier. So you can say this, you actually have a separate key, or you can't store this as a separate key. So we, when you're loading a user, you say get your, that user's version, and that user's version is one or five or whatever. And then you use that number that you get back and append that to their keys. So you said that the user key profile is not user five underscore profile anymore. It is five colon user five underscore profile because that is their version. And then if you want to flush that user's keys, you go and increment on their version key. And it'll knock it up to six. And so the next time you go to assemble that key, the key is six colon user, user five underscore profile and then that key doesn't exist, and then they're essentially flushed. The LRU will take care of the rest, and but otherwise you can flush massive amounts of keys just by uh, making them disappear. So what I'm going to talk about now is actually Lumen Cache D, which is a, a C driver that a lot of the, um, there's a number of Perl and Python and Ruby I think uh, only Lua and the Java one is only available via by Monty Tabler. So if you see them in the hallways, you can say, can I have a copy of your Java driver? Uh, by the way, languages we don't really like. We never put Java up, so what does that mean? I'm being nice. <laughs> yeah, anyway. That's right, I work for Sun now. Anyway. <laughs> so, thank you for being loud. So uh, C, C++. So Linux Cache D at the very core of it is actually a C driver. There's a C++ wrapper that's around it. Um, there's many other language drivers. It supports multi-git. It supports what we call asynchronous and synchronous modes. So it can do things like synchronously and asynchronously fetch keys, which is something that I believe only other Dustin, Dustin Spalling's driver is the only one that actually supports asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, there's a cache in cache D async that I've written about a month ago. Okay. That's it. So that's about it on those. Um, it supports uh, replication, so it can replicate data out through the network. Um, it's also got read through cache support, which was just added as the last version. So I'm going to show you some examples of this. Um, the cool thing about Libmin Cache D, as far as if you can read C code, is, is that almost all of the drivers around Libmin Cache D pretty much emulate the interface to it. Um, it's a little on the, the object -y side, even for C code. But the, if you can read the C example, pretty much the Perl, the Ruby, and all the rest look dead on it as far as their namespace goes. Yeah, is there a question about that? Yeah, so since you're specifically saying that the C one supports small we got small size, are you assuming that that PHP and others don't support Perl? Some do, some don't. Most most of the uh, popular ones do, yeah. but not all. But the whole, what about the Peckle ones? Peckle one does support so, the yeah. So this is an example of actually using it in C. Um, MimCache D create, creates an object called MimC, which is just really a structure. And then later, since it's being C, you would actually free it. So you do stuff in the middle of this. And this is an example of it uh, actually in use. So in this case, what we do is we have some servers. We populate those servers into a server list. And then what we do is then push those servers actually into the MimCache D object itself. So the memcached object, you can keep adding in servers. In fact, you can even take lists of servers and actually merge this list of servers together. So in its world, as you add servers, it continues to distribute out its actual uh, distributed hash, which we call wheel internally. Uh, this is a simple example uh, using memcached set. Um, the one thing about uh, with memcached compared to some of the other drivers is it's a very raw interface. A lot of the other drivers will actually use pieces of the protocol themselves. When we wrote the memcached, the goal of it was to expose the entire API. So instead of trying to use pieces of it for, or reserve for ourselves, um, we'd actually make the whole thing exposed. So give a little more access to what all is actually available to memcached. So in this example up here, you can see we actually mallow some values that will go in store. Uh, we create that, and then notice how we go through and do a set. And the set is interesting for a couple of things. One you'll notice, other than me pulling the mic off my hand, is you see memcache C, key, string length key. Um, the memcache key, the libmemcache key driver was actually designed to use for languages or in cases where 
you have very large keys. So if you've recompiled memcached to use more than 250, it'll actually tackle that internally. So it uses the, the length of the key to determine what it should be using internally. So it can be used for if you've recompiled your servers to larger key sets. And the goal is also to get around some long-term issue in the binary protocol is I suspect we'll have to deal with characters that are currently reserved characters. So there are characters that are, are reserved characters with keys today. Anything that's basically is an is graph you can use for a key inside of mcached, which means there's certain problems with multi-byte languages and stuff. And the goal is to get around that long-term for the future. Um, so you'll see keys, you'll see values. The time t is actually the unit of time for the exploration. So when the set object goes, it's actually a time t value it uses. You'll notice the UN32T. What this is called is flags. Internally in mcached, there's actually a block of, uh, of uh, uh, a set of bytes that have been reserved that you can use to put in for any kind of flags you want to implement. And I don't know, do you know which dealer drivers let you see these? Or? I don't think any of them do. Okay, so this is something a little bit unique with mcached, is you can not only store a value, but at the same time, you can actually store flags. And I've seen people use this for generational stuff. So they put in generational, like this was generation one, generation two. I've also seen people use it to like say what was the mime type or the content type internally. I think Tim Bunce did some, a little bit of extra work in the Perl world in this. So you can not only store the object type, but you can say, oh, by the way, this was a JSON object, or this was an HTML object, or this is whatever, by using the, the byte category. So this is not a part of the value, but instead it's a small amount of reserved memory that was set aside for the driver. Most of the other drivers use this to indicate if the value was compressed or serialized. So if you're storing streaks and bytes, this what the flag value will only zeros. If you set something that ends up being compressed, it would flip the one compressed bit. And that's actually compression is something that all the clients <coughs> that worry about for what their flags are. This this is unique per client for the flag is set. If you set uh, most of them are just have another bit that is used for native language serialization, Marshall and Marshall and Ruby, Oracle and Perl and so forth. Uh, but in Linux cache, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So you have that additional set of spaces for using regenerational IDs or anything else. So it's actually fair game. Um, this is something else, and, and all the Perl and PHP drivers that inherit from it also still leave it as fair game. So as long as you're using one of those, you can access that extra set of UN32 uh, value. Um, this is an example of a multi-gate fetch. This is where we were talking about um, one of the things that some of the drivers can do where they can actually fetch multiple items um, at once. And so what it does is we implement a thing called pipelining in the process. What we do is we say, well, I got 100 keys or 1,000 keys or whatever else. And we take that and marshal them up as single uh, or as large packets that we then shove into memcached e. So instead of having to do get a key, fetch a key, get a key, <coughs> fetch a key, get a key, fetch a key, uh, we can instead say, here's 100 keys, give them back to us all at once. And then we read all those keys across the line. And the nice thing about memcached is it actually marshals all the values together so that we're not even actually basically wasting any space on the network. Um, this is actually, uh, if you run a uh, make test on memcached, it'll go through what's called a set of generate tests. And what I use is those are in there for all the different hashing algorithms so we can test how fast a given hash is. It's kind of part of the whole argument of my hash is faster than your hash. We're able to get rid of that by just putting it in the test file and saying, oh, actually, this algorithm is faster than this algorithm is for this environment. But if you look in there, there's a get test versus a multi-get test. And you can see that usually the multi-get tests are on the order between seven times to nine times faster when we use multi-get uh, over an actual get. So this is one of the, the big things that we can do is just pipeline as much, we pipeline as many keys as we want to and then fetch them back up. Um, and you can see how it actually works here. Mim say, uh, you know, here's a memcache key fetch, mc return key, return key link, return key value, flags, rc. Uh, and based on that we can just look at the, um, the rc represents what is the return type. Because remember for a fetch, zero doesn't actually uh, you can't always test if the object has value. You need to actually return the result. You need to look at the return type to say, was it successful? Oh, it was successful, but the value is actually zero. So this is the, one of the things we primarily see used a lot uh, to get up to get better speed. Um, this is something else that we actually have going uh, as well. This right here is uh, what we call a set by master. Uh, and I know the C++ and the C driver do this. Programmer is, is the original Perl does or not do? Cashman Cashman does. Okay. For the library. 
So what we can do in this, and this is all uh, the C++ version of the driver, is we can actually take a key and we can then arrange all the key, all the key values that are being sent to the server by that key. So let's say, for instance, you have a user and you need to fetch four or five objects always based on that user. So there's two theories in here. Either A, you spread that out, you do four or five reads across the network, or you fetch all of those objects back at once through the same socket. So if they're big enough to fit in the same socket, everything's good. So what you can do inside of Linux Cached D is you can actually say, here is, an, here is a master key, the master key being say the UID, and here's all the little keys that represent this object. You can actually then cluster all of the given environments, basically partition objects, into particular memcached D servers. So this is something that some sets of the drivers can actually do now, which is really handy if you know that you have, say, four or five small keys, which are always going to fetch them at exactly the same time. You can batch all that stuff up into one pack, into one socket connection, and just pull it across. So this is one of the optimizations uh, that we did. By the way, if you pulled the slides early and didn't have this slide, if you do an update, it'll have this slide. I, I added this during the, the middle of our, uh, during our break. So this is something that you can see that we can do. Um, the C++, by the way, our, the C++ interface is a good way that you can see pretty much how identical the, um, the, the given interface is. Because the set by key, the foo dot set by key inside of the C wrapper what that would be is memcached underscore uh, set by key. Inside the Perl driver, it's exactly the same thing, and same thing for the Ruby driver. So pretty much the function calls are about all the same. So if you can, uh, and one thing that we did early on, which uh, you can thank Mark Atwood for, is uh, I think I spent eight hours one day writing man pages on every function we had for memcached. So there is actually a ton of man pages, which almost nobody writes the things anymore, uh, on lib memcached. So even if you're using something like a Perl or the Ruby driver, it's actually worth typing man and the function name. And it'll pull it up and explain it in depth. And it can also explain all the behaviors. There's all kinds of stuff that you can set as far as replication and poll timeouts. So you can basically tune the thing to death if you want to. So there's all kinds of tuning parameters that can be done. But there are man pages now that exist on everything inside the server. And you can thank Mark for, for correcting all my English and explaining things better than what I did. Yes? Can you flush based on the master key? The answer is no. But while sitting here, I had an idea. Uh, and the idea is that I could actually add uh, a generation ID and prepend it into the keys for people. So probably sometime when I get back to my computer, I will probably add a new method, which we'll call memcached uh, generation increment, which will actually do that. But I didn't think of that until he was talking about 10 minutes ago. So I'll have that done sometime. <laughs> The master key is, is the primary goal of having the master key is ensuring that all of these sub-related keys end up on the same memcached link space. So when you request all of these keys once, you're only talking to one server with one packet, and you can roll back very, very fast. The namespaces uh, do not guarantee where your keys end up. So uh, if you really want to be efficient, you want to have generational expiry, and you want to have all your keys in one place, you actually use both. We use a master key, and we use generation. Why wouldn't you just serialize all that and store it at once? Uh, you can. Uh, a lot of people don't. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, live journal uh, pages need little bits of new profile information, but they don't want to uh, have to uh, follow the entire object of a user all the time. Uh, follow certain parts of it. Okay. So how do many of the clients handle uh, the multi-git when there's no master key? So the, the default is when you do a when you issue a multi-git to any of the clients, I think, it will break up the list and hash each key individually in the list, and then it will query all the servers it needs to to satisfy that multi-git. Okay, so that's probably faster than the single gits, but not as fast as a multi-git with the master key. Yes. Somewhere in between. Ooh. Well, actually, in memcached, what you can do is you can say get operation against the master key and then pipeline them all together. So it'll actually break them up and then pipeline the whole section of them together. So it does work. Uh, could you repeat that? I didn't catch it. Gotcha. Uh, what it can do is memcached, we can use batch, batch operation mode. So what we can do is we can take a master key and a set of subkeys, uh, take that, parse that out into the, the pipelines, 
take the next master key with the next set of keys and pipe that into the, the outlines. So we can sit there and work them all out and then execute on it. So you can do it uh, inside the new cache key. Okay. So. But by, by default, if you have uh, if you have five keys that just happen to hash into one server, those would be one packet, but everybody else will be in the back. We're storing that master keys. Uh, kind of. I guess the other packet don't show, like, is it only this language that can do that, or? Uh, so the question is, is this the only language that can do this? And, uh, Jerome, the C1 can do it. Uh, one, at least one or two of the Chrome libraries can do it. Um, I think I asked for this feature, the C yeah. library, because it was, it's really cool with Pro 1. Um, I think maybe one of the Ruby libraries might be able to do it. Don't quote me Well, the Ruby, driver, the Ruby driver that uses libmin cached D can do it. So I know it can do it. The, Pretty much any of the features you see live in cache D, you can just use any of the libraries that wrap around it, and you'll have access to all the features. So when you're saving the data, though, is it like a different function call, or is it from that key? So in the, I know in the Perl, and I'm pretty sure in the Ruby, they all use the same API, the same basically caller types in the API. So whatever we call it in C, they pretty much call it the same thing in the other languages. So there's a pretty good one-to-one -one ratio at this point. I don't have not seen drivers yet where they did anything like crazy like renaming stuff. So. so. Okay. So next example we'll do, uh, running is actually min D functions for MySQL. So an overview of all this stuff. So it uses uh, UDP API. So inside of MySQL we have something called user-defined functions. And user-defined functions allow you to extend MySQL by writing functions in C that are then just like any other function inside of MySQL. So it's the same thing as a count or running uh, a soundex or any of the other functions inside the database. These functions appear and work the same way inside the database. Now, what it did is Patrick over here actually extended and wrote a set of memcached D, uh, memcached D functions for MySQL. And we actually then are able to incorporate most of the features of libmemcached D back into the SQL language inside of MySQL. Um, at this point, it looks something a little bit like this. Um, what you have is memcached D with the MySQL servers. You access the UDFs that use libmemcached D, and then you control the actual libmemcached D cloud. So you can do things like deletions and, and get operations and so forth. Um, the installation looks pretty much like that. So what you would do is you load up a new set of functions. You can load as many of them or as few of the functions as you want to. So whatever you wish to actually expose. Um, so these will appear just as regular SQL-like functions that you use. And this is actually some of the functions that are available. Patrick's got probably a dozen, I believe. So you can do things like set the servers that the server that the MySQL daemon is going to be using. And then at that point, you can actually set behaviors. You can set objects into memcached D. You can get objects back out of memcached D. You can append stuff from inside the database to objects that are already in memcached D. You can prepend. Um, I'd say so far, most often thing I've seen is deletion. So you can actually delete operators. Um, you can tie these into SQL statements. And you can actually then even cause the replication stream. So for instance, this has started popping up a bunch. But people will have a data center over here and a data center over here. And what they'll do is, is they'll actually condition their memcached D clusters by actually sending an SQL statement to MySQL, the thing go over the replication stream, pop up on the other end, and then manage the memcached D cache on the opposite side of wherever their data, their data center is. So you can use MySQL replication to actually control two separate uh, memcached D clusters. This is an example of actually a setting via a select. So in this case, select ID URL, then catch the set, contact feeds, feed in the MDI5 URL, URL from feeds, and then you can see where the select. So in this case, what he did is he actually does a select, but what that select does is it's reading data through the actual database. It is also pushing that data immediately into MemcacheD. And by default, the UDFs actually use the pipelining method. So as it's reading across the table, if it read 100 rows, it would actually pipeline up the 100 rows, and then at the point that it found, at the, the select finish, it would actually final, do the final push and set all that data inside of the memcached D server. So it's not like it does each row individually. It actually pipelines up the whole thing together. I think it did that starting at, what, point 0.4 or, well, anyway, one of the most recent releases of the, the memcached D functions. 
And in this case, you can actually see where he doesn't MC get, and he actually just gets the number of the feeds uh, directly back out of memcached key. And throwing the key on the fly, too, with memcached. Yeah. To marry it to uh, the table name. Yeah, as Patrick's commenting, he's actually using contact to uh, actually come up with uh, the given keys. I thought that was very cute when I saw that. So this is an example of actually doing all this from SQL. Yeah. How's the uh, performance on this compared to doing it directly through the driver in, say, PHP or uh, <coughs> C or something like that, doing it with the selects? You're just picking your your. So the thing is that you're actually pick, picking your target. Now, what that means is, for instance, doing a set operation. If you do a set operation from the database, what that means is that from inside the database, you've actually sent the objects from the database. So you didn't send all the objects out of the database to your client and then send from your client into MCACHP. Instead, you all just got sent directly inside of an SQL server out there. Now, it may be that you got more I/O than you got than you got net, than you got processing power. So maybe you do want to send it all the way to the client. I suspect not, though. Um, so in that case, it's going to work as fast as it actually can work. So the nice thing is, you only copy the, you only copy the data once to the MinCached D server instead of copying from database out to client and then back into MinCached D. Um, there's an example here also you put in a trigger operation. And this is a trigger operation in goes. And drop trigger, so he, what he's done is he's done before an insert trigger on feeds for each row. He actually is doing an, in, he's doing an insertion based on trigger. So you can see as he inserts an object into the, into the database, that data is then automatically replicated out to MimCached at the same time. I don't see this as often as I actually see deletion occurs. Deletion I see far more often, where instead, when the, instead, of doing a, uh, instead of inserting it directly in MimCached D, you actually see a deletion operation, so you delete it out of the MimCached D servers, so that if somebody needs the data, then it forces the read through to occur again and for it to repopulate the database. That's a little more common, I've seen, though this isn't uncommon. You can do that too with a trigger. Yeah, you can be done with a trigger. And all of this would uh, <coughs> replicate. Um, I have seen people doing this. Uh, I also see people doing this instead of doing inserts into feeds using triggers. Um, for some reason, they end up using black hole a lot more often. So what they'll do is they'll create a fake black hole table, and they'll actually do insertion operations on it, and instead force it through these mechanisms. And I suspect they're doing that because triggers aren't always the fastest thing in the world. Um, so you can do the same thing as far as getting data replicated by just using black hole. So for instance, you can do an insert into a black hole table against a function. And that function would then drop into the replication stream, and then replicate over, and then fire off into a remote data center. Put it on your slave only. <laughs> Make your master the conversion <coughs> point and let your slave do the trigger work. Okay. Well, why not the master overhead? Yeah, you know, make your master do less stuff. It's already <coughs> done with rights. You could just do it on your master, but... Well, because wouldn't that eliminate a race condition of the replication from the master to the slave gets behind? I mean, it depends how, how quickly you need whatever is being put into MemCache. If it's something that you can feel that it doesn't immediately have to be there, then just put it on the slave. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's also row-based replication. I don't know the status of that, but that, that, that's a good way of dealing with issues such as triggers, because then you're just replicating actual data and mm -hmm. you know, having statements replicated to the slave or having to worry about whether the master and slave are doing the same thing. Sure, and I suppose with the design, if there's a read-through cache, you shouldn't really be caring if it's totally up to date or not. Yeah. Cache. Yeah. One of the <coughs> other big reasons why you use this design that is replicated over multiple data center is that if you have two data centers, you probably don't want to read over that call for getting them cache the updates. So if you have two data centers and three data centers, you have three data centers with three distinct or distinct pools of one cache data server. 30 here, 30 here, 30 here. And you want to make sure if you are trying to require your cache in your data center A, data center A gets a new uh, insert, you need to expire the cache there. You don't want to at that point expire the cache in all three data centers because the database is on the other side might not have gotten that replication yet. So this is built in specifically for 
or for some people's design, specifically to deal with replication lag. So the cache is only updated in the data center B and C after that local database has the actual data. So if, otherwise, if you're expiring the data out of, uh, if you're updating the data in data center A, it's five minutes until that user is updated in data center B and C. If you, you can expire the caches a lot faster than that, then it's in our A with a different view of your user than the rest. It's complicated, but. So what we're now going to get into is some tools that you can use to manage your lives, to manage your uh, MFT servers. Um, first thing we just mentioned back, the first way, the, the best way probably to bug this thing half the time is just tell them that to the port and start passing any queries. Remember that the protocol is entirely text-based at this point. So you can always just tell them that in and actually look at commands. So to know that, that's one of the easiest ways to handle it. <coughs> the uh, other thing to do, there's an MCASD tool, which... So, uh, MCASD, MCASD distribution comes with a simple example tool right in Perl, an MCASD tool that's very simple. It only uses a couple... Uh, it was kind, of, kind of built to handle the slot reallocation stuff that wasn't finished, but it also does uh, so you can display your, your stats. So you can say, if I want to just have this tool format my stats a little better and show me what they are and some extra, and you can go in and edit some lines with your hit ratio and so forth. Uh, also, if you want to display uh, some merged stats, uh, stats items and stats slides together and show you a nice, pretty detail of what your slides are doing. And it's very easy to extend. So you can look at it. If, you want, if you're thinking about building tools to help you manage your MFT cluster, you can take a look at this guy. It's very short, very simple. And There's also the Libmin Cache D tools. Um, we now have them in Solaris as of the next version. Uh, Ubuntu has them in the next version, and I know that the Gabor core, I believe, has them now in Extra. So um, these should be in distributions by just default pretty soon. Um, there's a number of tools we wrote. Um, copy. <coughs> this allows you to just take a file, say I want to copy it based on a, a key name. Just pipe that into the side of MimCache D so you can just copy a file or copy anything else. There's uh, MimRM, which you can actually use to remove objects from it. Uh, uh, one of my system friends said, oh, wow, I don't have to write code anymore. I can just do all my MimCache D stuff in uh, uh, Bash, which made me kind of icky, but oh, well, it works. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes. Anyway, MimStat. Uh, MimStat is actually a command line tool that you can actually dump the current status of a MimCache D server out to the command box if you're interested in all these statistics, it'll do that. There's also a uh, MimSlap, which has everything to do with MySQL Slap. Uh, basically, when I first started working on this, we had to find a way to do uh, load testing and performance testing. So it's fairly early in its generational life, but it actually starting to get some use. <coughs> so you probably want to monitor MCACD. There's lots of fun statistics that are printed out when you run, when you tell that and type stats. You get your hits per second, your get commands per second, your set commands per second, you can calculate your hit miss ratio, uh, you can take a look at your, your CPU usage and whatnot. And uh, if you have nothing else, use MRTG. There's tools online, uh, there's, there's free scripts, some are around floating somewhere that can do MRTG graphs. Uh, these were some Nice donated graphs. I'm going to have to look over here to read the actual numbers, but you get an idea from these that these are actually uh, fairly sick. There's a huge amount of data going to this guy. The top graph is showing a uh, good 6.8 thousand requests per second going against the cluster, um, and I've seen worse. So this is MemCache D. The, the middle graph, the top graph, is the, the hits per second. A nice big spike, whatever, great. And over the same amount of time, the middle graph is really on the amount of connections that are open in MCACHD. And that's 10,000. You have 10,000 connections open to this, uh, probably a couple instances, but it could be a single instance here. And it's going fine. The graph below that is actually the CPU graph. This is actually 200 machines. So, by the way, that's in the US graph. That's actually Japan. So this is the, the largest of the uh, the largest of the the uh, social networking sites in Japan, which is Nixi. That's the graph for their site, so you can actually see when they tail off there. So lots and lots of usage. Everybody drinks sake. So uh, <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's kind of what you see there. And lower you can see their uh, you can kind of see basically they're pegging the CPU constantly. 
That's I hope. So or that I hope. Oh. Yes. You can see uh, a little bit of blue down there, where that color is, about when that giant spike is at the top, and that is MCAT CPU usage across the cluster. So it is pretty heavily idle, given all of the huge amount of requested data going to it. So there's also a number of other tools. There's Cacti, there's Ganglia. This is a, another graph that, I uh, <coughs> can't remember who actually gave it to us. But this is a Memcached uh, current connection, so you can see the flow of their connections. There's lots of monitoring tools out there available. I believe the MySQL Enterprise team is actually trying to, to write a, their own system to put in Merlin. So if you use that, uh, the Enterprise monitoring will probably have something soon. This is uh, somebody tracking their requests per second uh, across their uh, Memcached D servers. So all of this is pretty much available out there. So if you've got Memcached D running in your data center, you should have not have much of a problem with actually monitoring. And you can get fancy and a graph like this and have a little bit of calculation and you can figure out the hit ratio actually changes over time. So if you're graphing your hit ratio, you correlate that with a code push. If someone pushes code, the hit ratio takes a dive and you go yell at the programmer and say, 2 p.m. is one way. And uh, there are other kinds of, there are other sorts of things you can kind of aggregate out of the stack to make you graph addiction and kind of memory errors. So this is a little bit about where we're at right now and where we're going with the, the project. So we released the 1.2.5 release sometime about the last month, and this is the current GA version. Um, these are the basically some of the primary stuff that was added. Um, one is the multi-interface support, um, which kind of fell out of doing IP version 6. So you can now actually tie multiple interface cards directly without having to do any kind of kernel foo directly with it. So if you've got, you know, four 1 gig NICs in it, you can actually use four 1 gig NICs now without doing any kind of interface foo around the kernel. Um, UDP has now been enabled uh, all the time. It's going to make it a little bit easier for us driver riders to actually support it. Uh, there was a no reply that was done with set, uh, which now um, none of the drivers support it today except for cache, new cache deep fast. Yeah. yeah, I'll probably add this to new cache deep pretty soon, but it allows us to do set operations that don't require any responses from the server. So we can actually pipeline more and more data into the server without actually having to, to know anything about it. Um, there's been Solaris support that was actually added, so as of 1.2.5, MimCatchD works well with Solaris. Uh, large memory page support was added for that at the same time. Um, there was a get time of day optimization, uh, basically to remove calls to the time itself. And then the server is now, uh, the server now can bind uh, against IP version 6 addresses. Um, so if you've got an IP version 6 environment, you can use it. Who cared about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the hobby project? Okay. Yeah, so what, uh, the answer is that there are two reasons. Uh, one, I just finished with the MySQL server, so it was easy to do because I already had all the knowledge in my head. And the second thing is when I fixed it, by fixing it, I was able to fix the multi-interface support, and at the same time, I was able to remove all of the locks around name <coughs> resolution, which really don't matter a whole lot, but let's go on and throw out the name resolution locks anyway. So all that goes away. Is, is name resolution a option to say what the command line or the big file? <coughs> oh, the name resolution, uh, when I optimized it out, I optimized it out. Is it, the name locks are gone because we don't, we don't actually, uh, when I recoded up the interface, the two pieces where we looked at what would have caused a resolution to occur, I just removed them from the code because we were doing the resolution on here, but we weren't even using the data, so I just chopped it out completely. Okay. We also added some minor bug fixes and uh, stack items now has as a one to five and the out of memory for an eviction stack per stack for per stack flat class. Should we wrap that piece? I should, but I need to get it into production first. <laughs> okay. Wikipedia runs it, I think. So it's safe. So future of all this stuff. So this is what we're working on currently. Um, know by the way that there's a shorter hour long talk tomorrow uh, that we added to the schedule at uh, like 2 o'clock, um, and I may talk a little bit more about the future there. Um, but tomorrow night there's a hackathon, so if you're interested in actually getting involved either with testing or writing code around this, there's a hackathon that will be occurring where we're going to be working on some of the future projects. So if you can uh, write code, you should show up. And if you can't write code, come drink beer. Uh, anyway, <laughs> binary protocol is the big thing on the top of the list, which we will hopefully finish the decision on uh, by then. Basically done. <laughs> 
So the binary protocol will allow both the text and the binary protocol to interrupt at the same time. Uh, the binary protocol removes some of the parsing perform parsing issues. It actually adds, can allow us to add in a few new features as well. Um, there's the other thing that we're looking at is the multi-engine support, which I find particularly interesting. Uh, not just because I did this with MySQL, uh, but also because um, it makes it really interesting inside the server. We can start adding in things like durable stores, take things like Tokyo Cabinet, and actually make it a durable store behind MinCached D. So all those people who say, hey, after my MinCached D server goes down, I'm going to come back up and still have data, we can actually do that by putting durable storage engines behind it. So if you want to pay for that, you can pay for that. We can also do things like add a queuing engine, so stuff like what Starling is doing today, we can actually do directly in MinCached D. Um, we can also do things like char based one, so stuff like tomorrow, if you go look at the violin memory folks, they've got these one terabyte slab machines, we'll be able to write, we'll be able to put engines on that so that MinCached D could actually use um, their product as a, a big old chunk of RAM. And uh, the other thing I want to do is fix it so that we can pull the engine interface out. We can start fixing some of the, the issues that allow us to go up to like 128 processors or more. And at the same time, which is actually more important, actually go back through and thread, the hack, uh, uh, thread up the hashes a little bit more inside of MinCached D. So that by, uh, sorry, by partitioning the, the, the hashes inside of MinCached D, we should be able to actually scale MinCached D to actually respond very well when people get in many, many processor situations. Or worse, when you start throwing extremely large slabs of memory out of it, you won't be dealing with a single lock to access memory. You'll have multi-locks that will be able to do it. So it should actually boost read performance and set performance on the server. What else do you got in mind? What else is for the future? Well, the future is whatever people tend to ask us. I'm on the, I'm on the mailing list all the time and the IRC all the time. And based on what problems people have and what problems are uh, I guess especially problematic or ones that we can't solve by changing our software or whatever are what we can do. So let's say an open project and respond. Uh, it used to be fairly dead in picking up the development. We have a couple developers in here, Tron went away. Uh, he's, this guy over here did all the Solaris support and fixed up a whole ton of for us. And uh Toru up front here is helping out with the container, the, the storage based stuff. And we have other other people, I think they might be here or might not, uh, but we have a development community now. And so we are actually able to take input from, uh, if you have a huge website, if you have a small website, please come and join the conversation. And that's our road time. So, next slide. So, some more resources coming out of this. Um, first thing, there's the Denga.com MidCat E, which is the, the current home for the project. It's probably going to move at some point, but at the moment that's where you can find out information. Um, we've had a really active IRC channel now for probably the last four or five months. Um, so if you go to the account in cache D on pre node, um, there's pretty much always somebody in the channel that's generally working on in cache D. Usually me or the must. So uh, the live in cache D driver can be found at that URL. There's also a uh, mailing list for min cache D, which is probably also going to be moving soon. Um, that's a pretty, it's a pretty low flow uh, uh, mailing list. This kind of spurts for every so often we'll see eight posts in a day, and then for a few post days we won't see any posts at all. So if you're not, you know, if you're worried about, oh my god, I just joined a mailing list that's going to give me 300 pieces of email a day, that's not that mailing list. Um, plus it has a pretty good archive, so it's good to go back in the archive and actually read the history of it, because you may actually find whatever question you've been wanting to ask, you may have already been answered. Um, the, ch the slave slides are going to be mailed, uh, available under a, um, uh, oh, I can't remember how you right now, is the Creative Commons. Creative Commons. So the plan is to put this under the Creative Commons for anybody to use. So if you, you listen today and said, wow, I want to take this back to my company and talk to my company about it, um, you can take the slides back, you can print them up, you can send them to friends. We're all good with that. The URL you saw them on um, may or may not stay there for that, that URL. Uh, definitely I'll be updating it for some time to come though, so as we get feedback for the slides, we'll be updating the slides. But the idea is to give these slides out to other individuals so that once that you listen today, you can take these slides and go back and use them in your own company to explain more about MCAT-D um, and what it's doing. So if you have any additions, or we had one person during the break brought up a great set of, hey, by the way, your, your chunky looking distributed hash stuff, I got far better graphics, which he did. Uh, we'll probably go in and exchange out the distributed hash graphic there and put those in. And so as we build up the slides, so please feel free to add us, you know, your own information 
bring your own projects that deal with NCAPT as well. So uh, in some cases, it might be free advertising. So send us information. And on that note, um, does anybody, let's start asking, uh, does any open questions that we haven't answered so far? Yes? You mentioned that there was some problem with the moon to buy sources. So the, uh, the NCAPT test protocol uh, is delimited by space and by new line. And so you can kind of understand the issue there if you take a multi-byte key, which might have a space as a second byte, or a new one as a second byte, and come up the protocol pretty good. Uh, so you kind of have to restrict what characters you put in the key right now. It gets a little better with the binary protocol, but then you become incompatible between the binary protocol and text protocol. So it's still a little up in the air. But as we move to the binary protocols, you can do anything with multi-byte, and that's just the way it is. So. Yes? What do you think about persistent connections? Use them, please. Uh, whether that makes it all free, so connect and hang on to that connection for as long as you want. Uh, you can have uh, with TCP, you know, a little bit of a back and forth around trip when you establish a new connection. So with the frequency that you were probably going to be contacting this SD, you do actually get a, a noticeable benefit over the aggregate of actually using persistent connections. Right. We do have, by the way, inside of the MemCache D and I think the program, we do have access to the UDP protocol as well. <coughs> so if you're wanting just to fire off lots of keys into the server and you don't really care if they get there or not, you're just doing lots of set operations, that is an option. Um, I would say that's not very well tested today. So individuals who want to use that are probably signing up to help us debug it. Um, <laughs> a lot of the patches are, are that they probably did a lot of the fixes were never sent back to the project. So that's something that I, I'm expecting that once people want to use it more, we'll get a little more testing on it. But know today, if you're using it, I would call that a, a very uh, a buyer beware sort of feature at this point. Yeah, Patrick? It'd save some performance if you were to uh, use my SQL for doing all the database operations necessary, joins and whatnot, but having your blobs and memcache. Well, it's not a durable store. So if you want to put a blob, you may want to use something like Mobile FS or uh, Lustry or any number of setups. If you're trying to do fast response on small blobs that are under one meg, makes makes sense to me as far as doing it. Yeah, uh, more limited on the blob size. You can you can cache them. So the, uh, certainly if you have cache, if you have blobs that will fit in the cache, you should really try to avoid putting them out minus QL. Under, under most storage engines, especially for a large blob, if you have a row with a little bit of data and a blob, that blob is going to be stored in a physically separate area of the table. So you can do an extra disk seek to get that blob. So you would want to be very aggressive. You can benefit by very aggressive caching that. But if you're trying to manage large files and you don't want to put that in MySQL, well, especially there are alternatives like MobileFS, which I like because I work on it, uh, and other alternatives. So yeah, there's also a hyper table. There's a number of projects for that. But for small size blobs, it works out really well. So, next question? Yeah. I only use uh, memcache as a distributed cache. Have you guys used any of the other ones that you worked on before? And so, what are your thoughts compared to this? I never used them, so I don't know. I've written ones that were worse than this. <laughs> uh, I started looking a little bit at or evaluated to a very, very light sense of the word uh, specific object caches. And, and especially in the Java world, the object caches are very popular. Where you, you implement serializable, and then this thing just kind of takes your object and makes it cache. But I tend to find that for most of these guys are much, much slower than memcached. They're trying, a lot of other cache products are trying to do an awful lot. They're trying to do way, way too much. They spend an awful lot of time going through your data to try to index it. They, they do an awful lot of things which really kills their performance. So memcache G keeps itself up there by just staying super. So any other? Yeah. What was the FS you mentioned for the uh, uh, mobile FS? Mobile? Mobile. Mobile FS is also a Danger.com project. I am uh, kind of babysitting a lot of the Danger.com project right now, so you're sitting on the mobile FS, all about this, I don't know uh, mobile FS is an anagram for ONG files and stores all the files for user pictures, your live journal, and all of the, the asset data stores for uh, some type data and other systems products. 
There's a couple of different open source projects to watch in this arena right now. Um, <coughs> ones that I've generally been impressed with is Mobile FS, probably has the most banner. Um, Hypertable's gotten quite a bit of, uh, of also mentioned at this point. Um, there's HBase. Um, I don't people like to set up ports, so I'm not that crazy about it. Um, so some of these, and they all have slightly different features, and they all do a little bit different things. So, but the the it seems to be right now people have stopped talking about POSIX file systems as so much. So basic open, close, whatever, and are still talking about you know the these object file systems like Mogile or Hyper Table. So it seems to be kind of the next trend. You know, all the cool kids are doing it sort of situation. Is it in the same lines as as you mentioned HBase? Is that in the same lines as the Google? Yep, Mogile FS and Mogile FS and Hypertable are all in the same thing as as uh, Google Cloud. Okay. So it's a hash table. What about collisions? How are collisions handled? They were collisions are fairly fairly well optimized. There are a couple of very smart people went over the hash table implementation a while ago, and uh, it, it buckets out if uh, there's a collision. So if, if you move, if the hash table is not very easy distributed, it would slow down a little bit like any other hash table, but it, I think it was tuned pretty well a while ago. Uh, somebody did actual static analysis on it and figured it out. Uh, the hash table also dynamically grows as you insert into it, so it starts out very small, and <coughs> once you have too many items in it and it gets a little unbalanced, it'll actually grow it in the background. Um, and it'll just keep growing it. Currently there's a little bit of a bug in there somewhere, but we'll find it, I hope, this week. Uh, but it doesn't seem to uh, in any profile anybody's done with it, they look at uh, as on time the internal function for a, a hash table lookup, and that is just so blazingly fast that it never doesn't even show up in the profile reports. So if anybody else has any questions, we'll probably be standing up here for a while. So you please feel free to come and ask us or ask us any time during the rest of the conference. Otherwise, thank you all very much for attending and I hope you all are <laughs>